we can try to, to start now. Um, hello to everyone. And um, thank you for being with us today uh, for the second session of the workshop entitled the Green Chemistry, Biotechnologies and Natural Resources. So today you will have presentations from several scientists from India and from France. They all work on natural resources and their value, especially for health and cosmetics. Their expertise is in analytical chemistry of natural substances, on biotechnologies and on health on co and cosmetics, and also in toxicology. They all have gathered thanks to uh, several initiatives from the Indian French Institute, the Future Tour in 2018, the Knowledge Summit of Lyon in 2019, and now the third Knowledge Summit organized in Pune in 2021. So um, the pandemic being still there, uh, we won't be able to meet formally, but we hope that you will enjoy the presentations and you will have questions to our speakers. Each will talk for 16 minutes. And uh, there we will have five minutes for questions at the end of each talk. And we will answer more questions at the end of the session if you want. You will hear today, Professor Sarada Tepali from the Central University of Hyderabad, who will present her research on phytochemistry and pharmacological targets of the selected medicinal plants. Then we'll talk uh, Dr. Alexandre Mathieu from the Biomolecules Conception, Isolation and Synthesis uh, team of the laboratory in uh, Paris-Saclay University. And he will talk about mucunia purulence uh, in Parkinson's disease, the Capicachu in Campavata, uh, exploring relevance of uh, Ayurveda and beyond. Then will come uh, Dr. Vishnu Prasad from the Center of Ayurveda Biology and Holistic Nutrition of the Transdisciplinary University of Bangalore. He will present his work on Ayurveda Biology, a transdisciplinary approach for health science and research. After Dr. Prasad, uh, we will have Dr. Uh, Cyril Santer from ISIPCA of Versailles, and he will present his uh, work on uh, supercritical extraction and chromatography coupled with mass spectrometry and their hyphenation for extraction to characterization of lipids. Then we will have uh, Dr. Varsha Kelka from the Department of Biotechnology in Mumbai University, and she will present a talk on validation of cosmetics, manufacturing, microbial analysis need and future. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we won't have uh, the chance to have Dr. Smita Pawar from the Osmania University of Hyderabad today because of administrative uh, constraints, and we're very sad of that. But finally, I will present you uh, our last results on uh, the exposure uh, to estrogenic isoflavones of the French population, and uh, our new evaluation can lead to potential health consequences. So please, during the talk, I will <clears throat> ask you to keep your microphone switch off. Uh, please use the chat box uh, for any question and we will relay them to the speakers afterwards. At the end of the presentation, you can of course also raise your hand to ask questions directly. And in that case, don't forget to switch on your microphone again. So now we are going to start. And please, uh, the Professor Sarah Tetali, you can uh, load your own uh, uh, PowerPoint and start your presentation. And you can, of course, introduce yourself. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Catherine Banato, for this invite. Are you able to see my PPT? Are you able to see PPT? Yes. Okay. So yes, you can. Uh, you can put it in all screen presentation if you want. Uh, that is giving me trouble. I, I tried that. So. But we we a, don't we can't hear you very well. Sorry. Oh, you can't hear so me. You have to, How about yes. now? Yes, it's better. Okay. Thank you. So I have to keep it very close. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Catherine, for your invite. Actually, we met during bilateral um, interactions between University of Bordeaux and India, Indo-French uh, Symposium. 
So uh, Catherine, along with her colleagues, she had been here to India, to our university, and we um, also had been to there, uh, to University of Bodo, along with, my vice with our vice chancellor and other colleagues. So that's how we met each other. Uh, and then now she invited for this. I thank for the invite. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Catherine. And also I in, uh, thank all the organizers for the given opportunity, you know, France side and India side and French Institute in India. And also most importantly, um, uh, Bai Pule University in Pune. So, so uh, I'll start my presentation. Uh, so you can ask me questions at the end of my talk. Uh, so based on the um, uh, uh, theme of the symposium, particular session, so I thought I would give on phytochemistry and pharmacological targets. Let me give you a small uh, um, background of my uh, expertise in this area. So actually, uh, before joining in University of Hyderabad in 2007 as a reader, um, uh, associate professor equivalent. Be earlier to that, I worked with um, uh, Cardiovascular um, Institute of uh, University of California, Davis, with an MD cardiologist, Professor Rutledge. So in, that, in their lab, I worked on several uh, clinical as well as uh, basic projects relevant to cardiovascular diseases, especially postprandial lipemia. Earlier to that, I had a, um, a plant biology background where I have graduated a PhD from University of Hyderabad from plant sciences. Also, I worked with microalgal technologies at Iowa State University and uh, University of California, Berkeley. Because of personal reasons, I thought I would go and uh, study about cardiovascular diseases. And then I had an opportunity to join Professor Rutledge lab. Uh, as a um, non-teaching faculty member. And there I worked several projects. When I was working, I thought those were all, I was doing the basic projects. So I thought, let me do think about some therapeutic solutions. At that time, I came across about reading about plant-based compounds uh, as a, you know, therapeutic solutions and Ayurveda. I started to read about that. Then at that time, the position got advertised at University of Hyderabad, so um, I applied and I was fortunate enough to um, get uh, here a position at University of Hyderabad in the Department of Plant Sciences. From 2007 onwards, I've been working on phytochemistry and pharmacological targets of selected medicinal plants. I give you a very brief overview of what we are doing and in detail about uh, just one of the plant compounds. So the question comes to why phytomedicine and phytochemistry? Uh, the herbal medicine is uh, taking a lot of interest. Uh, it's uh, steep rising. But at the same time, uh, several other people, they don't believe. So the question arises uh, um, oftentimes from conventional physicians as well as a pharmacologist and uh, uh, many other people, even public, whether this traditional herbal medicine is a myth. Are molecules related? So we pose a question that maybe some people are thinking it is a myth, and uh, but we ask question and try to resolve whether it is a myth or molecules, or it's all about chemistry. So plant-derived drugs is one of the uh, direct evidence to those people who question herbal medicine, and herbal versus conventional medicine are always uh, there are advantages and challenges on both sides. So the chronic diseases, the main question from conventional medicine is mostly they are single target based molecules. So the, um, the molecule, which is a drug molecule targeting a single target, whereas the chronic diseases are uh, multi-targeted. So how can we uh, uh, cure such diseases or how can they be therapeutic when the chronic diseases are several uh, factorial, multifactorial based? That's the question comes. When it comes to herbal medicine, there are uh, very many chemical constituents and uh, they are uh, very depending on where the plant has been grown. And most importantly, the challenge is identification of the plant. So what is the future direction for this? And people like us who are working in this area, all of us um, should uh, you know, see a future direction for it. So I'm um, just trying to do from my side what I can do. It's not possible to arrest this kind of growth because the global interest in um, herbal medicine has been uh, very steeply raising. 
and now whoever asks mixer molecules i usually give examples like nicotine so when it is a plant based um, nicotine has a, such a problem i mean uh, effect on uh, neurological system are um, molecules like oleandrin they can be fatal to even human human being it can be toxic it can kill a whole person uh, the part, you know, adult human being also and how about these um, several um, vitamins which are derived from uh, plant based uh, nutrients or whatever and including uh, henna so our our henna as well as uh, cannabis sativa hemp so all these are molecule based so then why not the medicine uh, we are talking about herbal medicine that's how i bring the topic to it's not very appropriate for this uh, group because all of you are working with uh, um, plant related molecules natural resources but it's for general public which is what uh, it is there is a drugs derived from medicinal plants especially multi billion dollar drugs like aspirin and uh, um, uh, codeine and digoxin and uh, um, you know paclitaxel which is anti cancerous drug all these drugs also support uh, the herbal medicine that it is a molecule based uh, not a um, mixed one and uh, especially my interest is cardiovascular diseases in this particular area already uh, the drugs uh, which have been uh, used by uh, physicians and the conventional uh, practitioners is they are nothing but derived from a plant based one one is a digoxin or uh, from digitalis purpurea and aspirin from uh, salix alba uh, and also statin from fungus uh, japanese scientists isolated these which is a cholesterol reducing agent aspirin is a uh, anti thrombotic drug and anti inflammatory drug and digoxin is for cardiac failure it works on sodium potassium pump and but the lately because of the uh, the nobel prize recently um, received by uh, miss yu yu tu uh, for isolating the artemisinin from uh, um, uh, <clears throat> artemisia annua plant <coughs> uh, the what is it called confidence has raised not only uh, herbal people but also several journals you can see that they are considering publications in this area much better than before uh, 2015 lately i see uh, some interest is coming from journal side and also the funding agencies are coming forward to fund plant based medicine earlier it was so difficult even to publish or even to get any funding when we don't talk about the pure compounds when we talk about mixed herbal drugs now i would like to um, justify why herbal medicine is important compared to the single uh, molecule based therapy because uh, cardiovascular disease is uh, as i mentioned that multifactorial uh, the disease itself and uh, again it depends and it's promoted by various other diseases including diabetes renal failure patients ultimately they would die because of cardiac complications and also because of the occlusion of artery which supplies the blood to the cardiac muscle so um, the kind of uh, there are several cell types are involved in it uh, this is the obstructed uh, artery and which is uh, supposed to flow blood very freely but it's an obstructed which supplies the blood to the cardiac muscle so <clears throat> so the heart attack it can lead to the heart attack and how is it a single target based no in this several cell types are involved in it and especially the activation of cell types this activation why they do it it is like a defense purpose for especially these monocytes thc on cells you know uh, they get uh, activated for every kind of um, exposure to any toxins so several um, including uh, diabetic patients or high fat uh, rich in high fat diet all these would activate these monocytes which are in the blood and they would in turn activate uh, endothelial cells which is the lining of the blood vessel wall uh, um, it is in contact with the blood vessel and this is the interface between the blood vessel and the blood and they in turn activate this cell type and they transmigrate and then they start to release uh, various cytokines and other inflammatory molecules ultimately it leads to the plaque i'm not going into too much of details because of the time factor uh, but how our several cells are involved in it 
and several molecules are also involved uh, chemotactic as well as uh, inflammatory cytokines and these all these are involved uh, apart from that cholesterol is also involved which is well proven and oxidative stress and uh, thrombosis and inflammation all these will uh, promote each other and they eventually cause uh, cardiac issues after sclerosis so now the the direction the new direction is a new paradigm for it uh, <clears throat> Herbal medicine is a, a, we have to see in a different perspective. Of course, my lab is too far away from it, but it really attracted this publication. It had come from uh, China. It's very interesting that, that uh, you can see like uh, even in uh, molecules that we are talking about conventional medicine, they see several uh, targets, like for example, aspirin. It show, they show that aspirin can show this benefit, that benefit, this benefit. Whereas in a herbal medicine also, there are several molecules. At the same time, they can handle several um, uh, um, targets. So, but the other way is they can have some impurities, some toxins, not, need not be impurities, also some toxins. Also, you, we need to, uh, checks and balances should be there. So it's very much essential. So uh, for this, so as I'm talking about this session, it's the foremost important for herbal medicine is the chemistry. So how do we know the chemistry? It's so complicated. And uh, even, uh, uh, we, we, even we are not talking about the primary uh, metabolites of plants, which we are talking about uh, proteins, carbohydrates, lipids. Apart from that, they uh, produce a lot of secondary metabolites, which are involved in uh, anti-inflammatory and antioxidant molecules, and also they can interact with several of our receptors. That's how they can give either toxic effect or therapeutic effect. <clears throat> so is it easy? No, it's very, very challenging to do chemistry of that, but the latest technologies, the improved technologies, uh, which are kind of, um, uh, you know, HPLC, gas chromatography, liquid chromatography, which are you know, coupled to, Mass spectrometry are giving, uh, uh, actually helping to a great extent to know the, what is the chemistry of these. And NMR, of course, I'm not at all um, know much about NMR, so I don't talk much about NMR, but we have these facilities, GCMS and LCMS. We routinely use these technologies to see uh, what is present in our, we use these techniques not only to authenticate our plant material, but also to see what is the chemistry of the extract. The plant can have many, many, uh, all the literature says this plant has this, this plant has that, but again, it boils down to how we extract, where we grow it. So it is always better to do our extracts, which we are applying on the cell lines for anti-inflammatory or antioxidant or any other target-based bioassays. It is better to know what we are extracting what is the material we have taken and how we are extracting. Mostly we do only hydroalcohol, ethanol based. I don't even use ethanol because in future, if you want to uh, <clears throat> take it to the, the clinical level, we don't want to use such uh, uh, reagents like uh, methanol and other toxic ones. So we subject our plants to this. <clears throat> and along with Catherine and colleagues, we uh, have written a very beautiful book chapter. So I thought I would share with you this. Uh, it's been published in advances in uh, botanical research, not only herbal medicine, but also dietary supplements. And I think in Europe, I heard that they have been referred as a dietary supplements. Or <clears throat> in India, we say the herbal medicine. And uh, for that, how metabolomics uh, help uh, to not only know the, what is the chemistry, but also the quality control of the products which are skyrocketing in the market. So wherever there is money, we have to um, also uh, um, imagine or we can expect uh, some type of uh, um, bad things too. So uh, quality control is highly essential. <clears throat> Either ignorance or intentional, um, uh, some non-desirable constituents can come into the health and medicine. So we wrote a chapter saying that metabolomics would help uh, to uh, really meet uh, uh, <clears throat> So let me go to our. Uh, uh, so um, we have worked several plants, but I give you very briefly about some of the plants which we uh, did uh, my mass spectrometry. For example, Tinospora cardifolia. Now during COVID time, it became a very very uh, popular plant. So I thought I would see that. 
I would show you, share our data with you. And uh, we used uh, LCMS based um, at, uh, I mean, protocols to authenticate the medicine, uh, whatever we have been at you know, call your C, we have isolated, I mean, uh, detected, and based on that, we authenticated. And uh, in the ethanolic extracts, we have seen all these metabolites in that. Apart from I just show you chemistry of MSDS. I do not go into all the components. We have published all these results uh, in uh, Journal of Ethnopharmacology. In, uh, uh, we published about three uh, manuscript uh, papers in Journal of Ethnopharmacology and one in Phytomedicine showing our mass spectrometric data. So, so the what we got this uh, bark, uh, terminal Ajina bark from uh, Tirumala Hills Forest. Um, uh, from a collaborator from there. And then we have identified very important compounds like arginine and arginolic acid and arginic acid. And also asthma and sanctum. And we have uh, did the phytochemistry analysis. I will not go much into it. And this is very interesting. We did with turmeric, uh, curcuma langa and curcuma aromatica. Uh, this is within a plant, the variation, cultivars. So these rhizomes are from, we have taken from five different uh, uh, cultivars, uh, two from Aromatica and uh, uh, three, five from uh, Langa. I have not shown all of these here, but they are all uh, they are very they are all grown at the same place, but they varied uh, quite a bit. And we published this in Pontiers in Pharmacology very recently. Uh, we collected about 200 metabolites from each of them, from essential oils of uh, turmeric, um, isolated from all these uh, seven cultivars as well as by GCMS analysis, we did it. And also we did uh, methanolic extracts using uh, LCMS-based profiling. So that's how we do uh, take care of the chemistry of uh, phytochemistry of our herbal medicinal. When it comes to <clears throat> targets, the systems we use is uh, THP-1 cells. We purchase from uh, NCCS uh, uh, Pune. Uh, actually, in very nominal price, they charge very nice of them. That's why they are affordable. But endothelial cells uh, we purchase from uh, uh, in vitro gen company, which are highly expensive. And the monocytes, they secrete, you know, whenever they are activated, several cytokines and uh, chemokines. And also, it's uh, the beauty of the system is we can differentiate them into macrophages, second stage of uh, inflammation. And finally, we can also do uh, foam cells, which are, uh, you know, uh, macrophages and foam cells, they differentiate into under the layers of the artery. And we, at the protein level, we do ELISA, our flow cytometry, and also oxidative stress, we uh, detect the oxidative stress and antioxidant effects of plant extracts using the uh, chlorophyll fluorescence dye. Uh, upon oxidation, HCGCFDA will fluoresce. Uh, a non-oxidized one is uh, stays uh, colorless. You cannot detect uh, at the emission and excitation wavelengths we use. Apart from this, I also wanted to present on lipo uh, lipase enzyme, but uh, I, then I decided I don't think the time would permit. So we also do some real-time PCR of uh, several molecules that you will be seeing it. And Tinospora cardiophobia, to begin with, uh, we just uh, see, uh, we take, because ours is not a cancer-based lab, we take a concentration where 99% of the cells are alive, and we don't see much proliferating effect also. So those are the concentrations we do. And <clears throat> this fluorescence, we quantitated by confocal microscopy, we captured, and also in the presence of arachidonic acid, which induces oxidative stress. And the very important uh, target is that these plant extracts are uh, stimulating catalyst enzyme activity as well as a uh, transcript level. So that is very interesting. Catalyst enzyme is being uh, enhanced by the plant extract treatment. <coughs> Excuse me. And apart from that, the most important inflammatory marker is uh, tumor necrosis uh, factor alpha. That is also we have checked uh, using a bacterial endotoxin. Um, the cells would release uh, this uh, TNF alpha uh, by several times, uh, several hundreds of times. Whereas when we uh, give TNF alpha treatment in the presence of plant extracts, it attenuated uh, to a great extent. So minus LPS and uh, plus LPS, as well as a transcript level, as well as uh, at protein level, we have done by ELISA and by 
real time PCR. And then we tested that TNF alpha is under the control of NF kappa B. So we have checked whether NF kappa B translocation is affected or because only TNF alpha secretion is affected because we are doing by uh, ELISA, which is secreted outside the cells uh, into the cell. But uh, here we have used the P65 antibodies where DAPI used for nuclear staining, uh, and then we used the merged images. So when there is no LPS is there, so, so you can see uh, most of the nuclei here, the blue in color, because NF cap of P65 is in the cytosol, which is locked. Upon uh, during inflammation, upon uh, inducing with uh, bacterial endotoxin, this NF kappa B will be pink in color of nuclei here. Whereas when we intubated uh, along with LPS in the presence of uh, Tinospora cardifolia or alcoholic extract, they are more closer to the control plant. So then we confirmed by, um, I will not be able to explain this uh, Western blotting, is confirmed by you separating nuclear as well as the cytosolic extracts, the proteins we have separated, cytosolic and nuclear extracts. And we use the beta actin as a, a marker for cytosolic fraction, whereas histone for nuclear fraction. And we confirmed that whether in the presence of LPS, what is happening to the NF cap of BP65. And this is what we uh, published in uh, phytomedicine. And uh, from the LCMS, we identified also uh, several bioactive molecules. We have not published yet. And then we purchased those molecules from Sigma and we tested some of them. Interesting one, uh, phytoalkaloid, though we could not uh, detect this in our alcoholic extracts. Um, using leaves. This is mostly reported in the roots of Tinospora cardifolia. But however, we purchased the berberin from Sigma and we tested because it is an alkaloid known to be highly anti-inflammatory. And uh, similarly, as I explained before, we did several markers by real-time PCR as well as uh, um, ELISA. So we tested all the uh, markers. So I will not go into details. And similarly, we have tested the berberine effect on nuclear uh, translocation of nf kappa B, P65. And then what we have done, uh, we really wanted to know the target. So from um, LPS to uh, P65, in order to have the target can be uh, probably the uh, berberine is interacting with uh, mid-88 or IKK alpha, uh, but our um, results say that it, uh, I kappa B is being uh, involved in it. So I kappa B here. So um, um, uh, drug discovery specialist, uh, Dr. Wei Li from uh, Tennessee Health Center um, in United States of America. So we took his help and then we tried to do uh, um, docking of berberin on various targets. Very interestingly, we identified that IKK alpha uh, is being the target for berberin, and they also compared with uh, standard drug molecules, which are, you know, bind to IKK alpha. And then we have tested that, and then it is able to inhibit IKK alpha's uh, function, thereby IKK B is not phosphorylated when it is not phosphorylated. So they uh, join together and they are not detached so that there is no uh, translocation of P65 into the nuclei and the turning on the uh, genes. So this is a summary of uh, this. Sarada, you, yeah. you should stop very soon yeah. now. Thank sure, you. Sure. Summary of the findings is a master tree is veterinary-based medicinal plant extracts. And also the uh, medicinal plant extracts should be clearly have seen oxidative stress, antioxidant, as well as anti-inflammatory. Uh, and the P65 also, we have tested only with one of the molecules. Berberine need not be all the molecules. The target is the IKK alpha. We have to separately do for each molecule. So I stop here. And these are my PhD students who worked, contributed to this. Uh, uh, and these are my collaborators. Uh, and also on some other project, I have a long standing collaboration with the Professor Jan Kosti uh, in Germany. And Professor really helped us in drug docking, and we received the funding from various funding agencies. And uh, with uh, thank, uh, so we would like to bring a traditional medicine and um, artificial intelligence like uh, very advanced technology to together. 
and uh, eat healthy and stay healthy. And uh, now I take questions from you. Thank you all for uh, being patient. Thank you, Sarah. That was very interesting, uh, as uh, as usual. Uh, do you have any question for Professor Sarada Tedali, please? Uh, I have one, maybe. Uh, you, you, talk about, you talk about the antioxidant effect. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, well, in France, we are now considering that sometimes uh, when the antioxidant uh, load is too heavy, uh, we can have deleterious effect. Do, do you think that it can occur really or, or not? Yeah, I would say yes. Uh, if you, uh, because the inflammation is essential for pathway, no, sorry, oxidative stress is essential for operating several uh, uh, signal transduction pathways. So too much of antioxidants is uh, not good. But we have seen a basal level of, it never went to, um, when they are stimulated, they never went to below the control. But this is a very artificial system, but uh, when somebody is taking clinically, the results can be totally different. But as you perfectly mentioned it, oxidative stress is essential for operating several signal construction mechanisms. Okay, thank you very much, Sada. Uh, so are there any other questions? So thank you very much. You can stay thank with you. us, of course. You, okay. You're welcome. Yeah. But sure. now we are going to, to welcome uh, Dr. Uh, Alexandre Masuk. Thank you, Alexandre. And you can share your screen if you want, as soon as possible. OK. <laughs> Here we go. So, so please just introduce yourself and then you can start your, your presentation, okay? Do you see my slides? Yes, very much, okay, very well. Fine. Thank you, Catherine. Um, <clears throat> of course, thank you to the organization to uh, putting me in, the, in this uh, group and uh, giving me the opportunity to present my work. I'm an associate professor at Université Paris-Saclay uh, south of Paris in the Faculty of Pharmacy. I'm a pharmacist myself and mostly specialized in uh, analytical chemistry with uh, much interest on natural products. And also <clears throat> for several years now, I have been uh, involved in uh, uh, safety assessment and regulation and uh, um, public health uh, authority in France and uh, EU. So I would like to give an example of what we do here, um, especially in um, at the conjunction of our expertise and of my own interest into uh, Ayurveda and uh, medicinal plants. On a well-known plant, Mucuna pruriens, in uh, as it is used in Parkinson's disease, and since we are uh, uh, us attendees here uh, from thousands of kilometers away from each other. Uh, I would also like to uh, make a travel, uh, this doesn't work, uh, travel into uh, time and summarize what happened around uh, Parkinson's disease and, uh, and treatment. So uh, it's a very interesting situation where things happen in parallel in the West and in the East. Let me illustrate that <clears throat> around the second century uh, in the Greek and Latin work, uh, Galen uh, describes a disease which involves tremor, uh, difficulty to move, to walk and so on. And around the same time, where well, we can discuss about uh, when does the Charaka uh, arose and these texts, for my part, I consider is also around second uh, century. He also described what he calls Vepatu and uh, all the signs and the symptoms uh, clearly point at 
uh, what we call now a Parkinson disease. And at that time, in the text, you find that Mucuna prurians or Capicachu is used and can, can be used against and to, to treat or uh, reduce the symptom, symptoms of Parkinson's disease. Okay, then we have a huge uh, blackout on these uh, questions in the ancient uh, text and medicine. And then in Europe, in the 17th century, many physicists and physicians uh, describe again, each on his side, uh, symptoms that uh, obviously are Parkinson's disease. Parkinson himself, himself in uh, 1817, uh, described and, and like kind of summed up all the description before him. And he describes this uh, disease as shaking palsy. This um, um, disease has been named after him by Charcot uh, some decades after. And then uh, beginning of the 20th century, someone in Poland synthesizes L-DOPA, which is a very simple uh, compound for which no really use is guessed and the, the compound is, is let aside. Around the same time, in uh, just before the, the 40s, uh, two Indian uh, scientists from Madras isolate L-DOPA from Mucuna prurians. At that time, we can consider, okay, this is the reason why um, Mucuna prurians is efficient. Well, not, not exactly. We, we don't know at that time what is link between L-DOPA and, uh, and L-DOPA and Parkinson's disease. So back in the, in the West, uh, a Sweden, Swedish uh, doctor decides on this research, research on the central nervous system to administer L-DOPA intravenously to mice and he sees that this has a beneficial effect. And then it becomes clinical via intravenous administration and then oral in the 68 by Kotsiast, who was the first one to give L-DOPA to a Parkinson's disease patient with huge results as we, as we know. At that time, we can uh, infer that mucinaprians powder is efficient because of L-DOPA. And then in 96, Maniam, uh, obviously Indian, but who was working, uh, doing his research in the US, uh, validates the clinical use of uh, mucunapurians, of course, mentioning the content of L-DOPA. But then he sees that actually the benefits and the effect on the symptoms are better than equivalent amount of uh, L-DOPA. So, what is this mucunapurians? It's a fabaci, like a bean producing plant that may contain L-DOPA up to 8%. And uh, after Maniam, several clinical studies, not so many, but enough, uh, were available to show that the effect of L-DOPA, I mean, generally speaking, the effect of mucuna on Parkinson's disease was faster, longer, and with less side effects than uh, pure L-DOPA. So then the, the question arises by itself, are there molecules or some mechanism by which uh, a, a, a better effect is explained? So our hypothesis was to say, okay, maybe uh, Mucuna prurians uh, contains inhibitors of other enzymes of dopamine pathway, which is at the center of the Parkinson disease. So this is dopamine, and in the brain, dopamine is uh, biosynthesized from L-tyrosine using two or maybe more enzymes, okay? This is in the brain. Now, if we want to act on this pathway uh, with, with a drug, that uh, means that we have to administer orally, so it, it's in the gastrointestinal tract, has to be absorbed, cross the blood-brain barrier, and so on. So there is a, a trick that most of you know, that we cannot um, administer 
dopamine because it, it's um, it's emetic. It, it's, it has many side effects. So and also it doesn't enter the brain anyway. So we administer L-dopa, which can enter the blood, enter the brain, and be uh, transformed into dopamine. Uh, but then in the uh, in the blood, it can also be transformed into some metabolites. And this is also not uh, wished. So that's the reason why uh, I come back. Uh, it, along with L-DOPA, we administer inhibitors of this aromatic acid, uh, aromatic amino acid uh, um, decarboxylase. Okay, I will be short on that. Then once dopamine exert its effect in the brain, it's also catabolized with several enzymes into um, byproducts which are excreted in the urine. We can detect HVA in the urine. Okay, so our hypothesis was to say, okay, if we can inhibit these catabolizing enzymes, maybe we can increase the amount of dopamine in the brain, thus having more efficient effect of the whole powder than just dopamine or L-DOPA. So we did the bioguided fractionation, a very classical approach. We did several fractions and we tested, this is a, an overview of the LC uh, of the fractions. And then we, we did set up uh, three type of enzymatic inhibition assay on the dopa decarboxylase, the monoamine oxidase B and the catechol or methyltransferase. These enzymes we saw just before on the, on the, on the scheme. So the lower the bar, the higher the inhibition. So obviously these fractions were interesting. On monoamine oxidase B, these fractions were interesting. And on catechol o transferase, this was really a hit because many fractions were inhibiting this enzyme. So we targeted our efforts on these results. Uh, on the side, we uh, applied this um, screening method, CNS toward it, uh, on other um, extracts known to have such effects. So these are the results. And we see that basically our uh, set of assays can be used to screen efficiently plant extracts. Then on Mucuna, we isolated uh, more than 20 compounds. Some were new, some were already described. Uh, the black ones are new, known ones in Mucuna. Red ones are new compounds, never described. And blue compounds are compounds which were known and or already synthesized, but uh, yet never found into nature. Uh, of course, uh, we didn't have enough uh, amount of each compound for do the following assay. So we had to synthesize compound. We did that using extensively the, the pictet Spengler reaction, which is quite um, efficient and even have some um, stereoselectivity, but I'm not going to enter into details. And these are the results on the uh, catechol o transferase enzyme. Uh, of different compounds. And we see compared to tolcapone that some compounds were quite efficient. Uh, for example, uh, and at first place, the compound number 18, uh, 17, sorry, which is here on the side. So at this stage, we could uh, wonder, okay, how does this compound compare with other known and commercialized uh, catechol or methyl transferase inhibitors. So there are three on the market today. Uh, some are old, some are more recent. And the, the main uh, uh, difference to characterize these compounds are first, do they cross the blood brain barrier and are they toxic? toxic? So the oldest one, Tolcapone, does cross the blood brain barrier. And, but this is the only one to do so. That's why even if it's uh, quite hepatotoxic, it is still on the market. At some point it was withdrawn from the market and then put back again, because it really shows a particular effect. So starting from that, we could 
uh, ask ourselves, okay, what about our compound 17? Does it uh, cross the blood-brain barrier? Is it effective in vivo? It's, in, it's nice to see in vitro with the enzyme, but what about in, in vivo? Uh, about toxicity, we have the a priori that it's not uh, toxic because of the wide use of mucinapurians. So um, this is very uh, brief, uh, brief overview of all the subsequent analyses, but we uh, administered this compound 17 to uh, two animal models of Parkinson's disease, some worms that showed that indeed it was uh, inhibiting uh, catecholomethyl transferase in this animal model. And then in rats as well, on which we performed a behavior uh, um, assays. And we show that uh, compound 17, which is LF1220 on this slide, is uh, increasing the effect of tolcapone, but not as much as, uh, sorry, increasing the effect of uh, L-DOPA, but not as much as tolcapone, which is acting uh, much better than that. Uh, several behavior studies show that, of course, it is in, um, improving Parkinson's disease symptoms. And uh, extensive neurochemistry has allowed us to uh, decipher that uh, our compound 17 does not cross the blood-brain blood, blood brain barrier. So we were a bit disappointed, but given the structure, we were we were kind of uh, expecting that result. And it does not bind to dopaminergic, uh, dopaminergic receptors, which is a good side, a uh, good thing, which is means that it will not have uh, side effects. So few conclusions on that. First, on this very specific uh, Mucuna project, uh, it allowed us to develop a screening method for CNS uh, effect for plant extract. We isolated interesting compound uh, with interesting activity. And uh, the paper, which is going to be uh, published soon, shows that besides L-DOPA, of course, we now have COMT inhibition, but also all the other compounds which have been uh, isolated show that either antioxidant, either neuroprotective, not from our work, but from literature. And so there is really a, um, a synergy effect of the whole powder of Mucunapurian spin, and which goes much beyond only the effect of L-DOPA. And about Ayurveda, if you allow me to have some consideration on the, the place uh, of Ayurveda in, in medicine and uh, therapeutic um, arsenal, of course, it's a very old and empirical uh, medicine, but yet it has um, in many ways uh, a very relevant knowledge. Uh, and on several points, it was quite avant-gardist because uh, you can find in the text uh, all the, the priority aspects, which means, okay, each re remedy is, um, uh, must be personalized. Uh, the modern word for that is pharmacogenomics. So Ayurvedic uh, Vedyas knew uh, 2000 years ago about pharmacogenomics. Uh, synergies, of course, I just showed you a very interesting example. And galenics also, they were quite advanced on the quality control, even with empirical methods. So I didn't talk about that in this talk, but um, this is hours of fun uh, <laughs> if we would have time. And my personal interest, just to finish, would say that Ayurveda is, is most probably going to become more and more uh, of interest in, in, in the West and uh, either on alternative medicine or, uh, uh, or dietary supplement. And um, the problem being that if this is done in a wild way, uh, so, some side effect may occur and maybe some maybe put some, some spot on... Uh, on some stains on this medicine uh, for, for bad reasons. Of course, many people uh, contributed to this work. I try to uh, list them here and I thank you for your uh, patience and attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alexandre. You were uh, just in time. It's uh, really nice. And I think you have some questions, at least uh, Sarada, 
Tetavi wants to, to ask you a question. Please, Sarada. Ah, Dr. Masih, it's a very nice uh, talk. I'm very glad to see the synergistic effect. This is exactly what we have done with the asimum. Some of the compounds, we titrated the concentrations, what is present in the extract. And the same concentration would never give as equivalent to the plant extract. So when you have tested these various compounds, have you maintained uh, what is present in the plant uh, bean extract? Or do you have done some standard uh, uh, concentration? I haven't uh, processed the data in this um, perspective. Mm -hmm. So uh, we definitely tried several concentrations and uh, got a range in which activity was, was detected, but I haven't done yet the calculation to see uh, how it relates to the concentration in the plant. Okay. And by the way, we, we still have to um, quantify each compound huh. uh, in the extract. Mm -hmm. So it's a very interesting question. We need to know that it's uh, under process and uh, uh, then we will be able to, to, to correlate uh, mm. uh, in vivo or in vitro uh, data and clinical yeah. usual use of mucuna. Thank you for this question. Thank you, Axel. That explains the toxicity of pure compounds. Thank you. Yep. Is there any other question? I may have some, Alexandre. Uh, what do you plan to do uh, next? As, is, is it possible to to forecast, for example, a chemistry modification of the molecule to help it uh, pass a blood-brain barrier, for example? Uh, yes, we, we are thinking about that. We are also thinking about making some hybrids with uh, cannabinoids, since, as you know, I'm quite involved in that. So we are thinking about, yes, um, doing some um, chemisynthetic compounds to see if they could first uh, cross blood-brain barrier and second, act on other targets. Okay, thank you very much. If there is no other question, then we can uh, thank uh, Alexandre and uh, give the talk to, to Vishnu Prasad from, uh, from TDU University in Bangalore. Hi, everybody. Uh, Vishnu, you can come and, and share your yeah, screen. Yeah, good afternoon, good afternoon. And uh, am I audible? Yes, absolutely. Hello. Yes, yes, you are yeah, audible. Yeah, okay, thank you. Now let me just uh, share my screen. Okay, uh, hope you can see uh, see my screen as well, right? Yes, yes. Thank you, uh, thank you, thank you. Yeah. I switched off my 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 microphone. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. And you can introduce yourself again. Yes, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> so uh, before that, uh, uh, good morning or good afternoon and good evening for uh, uh, everyone. And it's really a great pleasure to have this uh, opportunity to present. Uh, uh, about our university as well as the philosophy or laying the kind of work that we are doing in our university and I put it as a title called uh, uh, Ayurveda Biology, a transdisciplinary approach for uh, health science research. So in today, uh, I'm not going to actually talk about the uh, specific, uh, of course, I will be mentioning something, but uh, overall, I'm trying to introduce this concept, what we are uh, uh, interested in and how we are doing. And uh, 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 I am an associate professor at the uh, Center for Ayurveda Biology and Holistic Nutrition, and I hope by the time I, you know, complete this presentation, uh, 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 that 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 will be the kind of you know uh, introduction for the kind of work what we are doing. But before that, I must tell you, like, I am a person trained in uh, cell and molecular biology, and our uh, work is completely focusing on uh, uh, Ayurveda concepts and all those things what we call it as Ayurveda biology. And I am also very much excited to have this talk just after uh, uh, Professor Elson's talk because uh, I personally feel that I'm continuing from where he stopped with his uh, conclusion slide. So 
uh, let's see uh, how uh, you know uh, i'm going to uh, uh, convey the uh, message what we are trying to do and uh, then we can have possibly have some uh, discussions as well so uh, just to uh, uh, set the context so uh, i i actually have uh, uh, broadly divided my uh, talk into uh, three parts like basically it is like you now what why and how what is this trans uh, transdisciplinarity and why it is and how we are doing so i believe that that kind of an explanation will give a very uh, clear but uh, at the same time it may be a very basic understanding because i will not be able to explain all the integrities that we are uh, playing in our uh, work so let me start with this uh, uh, concept what is this transdisciplinarity uh people are like particularly uh, people like you know uh, gregor and all those people they are uh, saying that most research whatever that we are doing is basically involving something like you know creating new knowledge which is like something like you know understanding the familiar uh, 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 to be uh, getting familiarized or conversant or acquaintance with facts truth principles or insights gained from study investigation and experience so for this we have different different uh, ways of uh, looking at that uh, problem and uh, one uh, common way of uh, seeing this is called as uh, disciplinary where you know you have different different disciplines uh, we used to take examples like chemistry physics etc where uh, different disciplines see that problem in a particular way using their uh, uh, tools or their methodologies and all those things and above this we have something called as multidisciplinarity where these disciplines are interacting each other but at the same time these disciplines will be uh, existing in their uh, you know silos and then we have something called as interdisciplinary where they start to integrate for people like us we uh, explain biochemistry and all those things as uh, interdisciplinary although there is an integration that is happening but still you will be able to find some kind of a, uh, you know uh, difference or you will be able to differentiate the discipline that are uh, integrated in that so for transdisciplinary when it comes uh, we believe that it is a complete merger of different disciplines where you are actually uh, you know not able to see the uh, barriers which are or the uh, different uh, you know uh, disciplines and their barriers will not be uh, visible at all so what is this uh, uh, requirement of a transdisciplinarity because uh, from the philosophical perspective as the complexity of the problem increases you will definitely require the integration of multiple disciplines and probably when the problem is very very complex you may have to go for a transdisciplinary kind of an approach so this is uh, transdisciplinary when i say it is not only related to uh, medical or something like that this can be applied in all sort of uh, knowledge generation but today and uh, also from my uh, you know lab perspective we will be talking more about uh, this uh, uh, concept in the context of health science and all those things so now when it comes to the health science uh, related approach that is the title of this uh, uh, today's talk why this transdisciplinary approach is uh, required so basically the idea is to uh, transcend the functional boundaries of whichever the discipline that you are uh, taking into consideration so why we are doing this because you know all that uh, all of us know that healthcare is a very complex situation and such a complex situation where the health or health care or for that matter treatment or anything uh you know, for that matter even biology also cannot be understood just by uh, one kind of a uh, you know approach say for example only looking through the lens of chemistry or only looking through the lens of uh, you know uh, physics or something even that matter biology itself is a very transdisciplinary field i would say so that complexity of uh, healthcare that uh, that is one reason why we need a transdisciplinary approach and the inadequacy of limited uh, viewpoint that can as that a single discipline can give us and also particularly in the case of uh, health uh, related aspects we really require a systems approach because in our body there are a lot of uh, uh, cells and tissue systems and all those things uh, which uh, each of these things will have a lot of you know biochemical pathways and all those things and in addition to that these are uh, cross talking each other so all these things to understand we really need to have a systems approach but when i say this uh, 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 yeah before that uh, so this uh, basically this uh, is to solve the complex problems and the people who have introduced this word transdisciplinary uh, they actually 
uh, grounded the uh, you know uh, formulation of this word in the three concepts that is uh, the complexity of science, chaos theory, and quantum physics. So according to them, the definition is transitionary, something like you know being at the same time between among and beyond disciplines. So it's basically something like unification of the world is what they were trying to. Uh, uh you know uh, imagine through this uh, transdisciplinary approach so now let us come to this uh, uh, important point that why ayurveda biology for uh, health sciences because we say that ayurveda biology is an example for transdisciplinary research so why do we need this kind of an ayurveda biology approach for health science research so there are two predominant schools of thoughts in science which is uh, called as holism and reductionism and Ayurveda, uh, already our uh, colleague had mentioned that uh, uh, it's something which is, uh, talks about the uh, entire system and all those things. And of course, it's empirical in uh, terms of its uh, uh, initial uh, text and also. So this Ayurveda represents the holistic view of uh, human health or human body, whereas the uh, modern biology and particularly the molecular biology and all those things represents the reductionist uh, view of uh, uh, human body. Actually, we need both these views, and both these views are very important. So, in the in the Ayurveda biology, what we are doing, we are actually trying to bridge this holistic concepts of Ayurveda with the uh, reductionist concepts of biology. So, when we say holistic concepts, it's something like you know we are trying to see the body as a whole, which includes all the crosstalks and uh, systemic uh, phenomena and manifestations, as well as uh, it includes the uh, the mind, its interaction with society, all those things are there. Whereas at the same time, you can uh, go down to the uh, organ systems, organ tissues and cells and DNA and other atomic angles. So why you need uh, this kind of a uh, bridging? Because, see, this is one uh, classical uh, image that you can see in all the uh, uh, internet, uh, Google uh, uh, places where this talks about the biochemical pathways in a particular cell. So this is the complexity of a single cell in terms of its uh, you know biochemical pathways and all those things. So now what is happening? The entire uh, aim of healthcare is basically to balance all these uh, biochemical pathways that is happening in one cell. But at the same time, we need to understand that this biochemical pathways in single cell is not sufficient. These cells are actually interacting with other uh, uh, cells through the uh, different different uh, crosstalks. So. Ultimately speaking, uh, healthcare is, in, in a way, uh, we can say that the balancing of this biochemical pathways at cellular level, as well as balancing that to the uh, functional level. Excuse me, uh, somebody's mic is on. Yeah, thank you. So this uh, balancing at the uh, functional level also. So this is where the beauty of Ayurveda biology is coming, because Ayurveda is also talking about a kind of uh, balancing which they describe uh, in terms of a particular epistemology called as you know dosha balancing or dhadu balancing or something like that so can we have some kind of a correlation between uh, the uh, uh, systemic level balancing versus molecular level balancing can we uh, correlate this molecular level balancing and its crosstalks and then can we have an understanding of this systemic level balancing so this is the kind of you know attempt that we are doing in this uh, you know, ayurveda biology approach and that kind of an understanding or a level playing role so that's very very important we are not talking about uh, you know uh, one system uh, which is to be proved by the other system or one system to be understood using the other system no this is basically a level play playing role how to integrate and how to bring both these things into the same plane so that you can understand the systemic level and the molecular level uh, changes at the same time so that will have a lot of contemporary healthcare uh, uh, applications is what or rather that is the need of the hour for the contemporary healthcare because particularly in the case of uh, complex diseases like let's say diabetes which uh, i am working on as well as uh, the kind of disease what we have just now seen parkinsons etc where a lot of uh, uh, interactions and complexities are there so uh, uh, it, it is uh, quite you know obvious that you need some kind of an uh, holistic approach but at the same time you cannot negate on the uh, molecular interaction so we need to bring in this uh, two things into the same platform so this is what is the idea of this uh, ayurveda biology 
So now the question is uh, how uh, transdisciplinary research you can carry out because it requires a lot of uh, thinking, a lot of, uh, you know, uh, stitching of different, different uh, concepts because the existing tools and techniques for biology research is basically or largely uh, rooted in the uh, reduction approach. So we need to uh, take all these things and we need to do a lot of uh, stitching and all those things. So I'll give a very, very brief uh, example of this Ayurveda fra biology framework for metabolic health with a special focus on the concept of Agni, which is there in the uh, Ayurveda and the uh, concept of uh, gut. So this is just uh, mm -hmm. a, a kind of in a, you know, a, a very superficial example that I'm giving. I'm not going to the details of this uh, research, but just to uh, uh, give that uh, uh, idea, I'm just taking uh, diabetes as, a, uh, as an example, because that is the area that I am working on. So what is our hypothesis of diabetes research in this Ayurveda biology perspective? The Ayurvedic concepts of holistic diabetes management through Agni. So here we need to understand that Ayurveda actually is not talking about blood glucose or insulin or something like that. So they have a condition which is called as Prameha and that is equivalent to diabetes. And Ayurvedic concepts of holistic diabetes management is through Agni correction. So Agni is the target there. And this Agni correction, it's a very, uh, you know, a broad phenomena, which includes a lot of metabolic uh, functions and uh, digestion absorption and all those things. So in our Ayurveda biology approach, we are correlating this with another broad uh, uh, concept that is emerging, that is gastrointestinal mediated glucose disposal. It's called as GIGD. Because this GIGD is also multifunctional or multifactorial in nature, and it has a multifunctional uh, effect in the body. Same way, Agni also has multifactorial and multifunctional effect in the body. So what we, uh, you know, uh, a cartoon representation of what we are doing is we have Ayurveda on one side and uh, biomedicine on the other side. Both these uh, things uh, can, uh, you know, manage a condition called as diabetes. And diabetes as a condition, if you see, which has uh, uh, its etiopathology, like uh, genetics, epigenetics, trust, lifestyle, lifestyle, circadian rhythm, all those things. And lifestyle include all your, you know, food habit and everything. So all these things are actually affecting a uh, an area which is uh, somewhere uh, centered in the gastrointestinal tract and we call it as gastrointestinal mediated glucose disposal. And this is very important for whole body glucose homeostasis. So the imbalance of this uh, GIGD or the imbalance uh, that is happening internally into the body and in turn affect because this is a uh, two, uh, two way arrow which in turn, uh, you know, uh, affect or, uh, you know, cause some imbalance in GIGD also. This is what is uh, resulting in diabetes. So if you can target this with the help of Ayurveda concepts of Agni targeting, we will be able to uh, you know, provide better holistic management strategies for whole body glucose homeostasis. And this whole body glucose homeostasis, especially because glucose being the uh, primary energy source that will help in uh, getting a better uh, metabolic homeostasis also because glucose, everybody know that plays an important role in almost all diseases in the body as well as gut is also now emerging as an important target that can have crosstalk with almost all tissue systems in the body. So in all these ways, the concept of Agni in metabolic homeostasis, though we are taking diabetes as one example, our uh, works are not uh, only limited to diabetes because as I have mentioned, this uh, gastrointestinal tract becomes a very key area which has uh, interaction with almost all the tissue systems. So in that way, if you see a glucose homeostasis could be one important aspect and glucose homeostasis can be uh, leading to energy homeostasis and overall wellness. So the concept here is uh, in Ayurveda biology, one day if you can see gut can be one uh, you know, target for uh, metabolic homeostasis. And if you go for specific, specific diseases, you can have uh, specific targets, for example, in the case of anemia, Gut is, again, uh, Agni is playing an important role, but uh, in the context of anemia, that target will be more of high-end bioassimilation and all those things. Whereas when it is uh, in the case of diabetes, the GIGD can be further uh, expanded to ingratin hormones and uh, digestive enzymes, etc., etc. So this is how this uh, Ayurveda biology transdisciplinary integration is uh, developed. But at the same time, when it comes to the actual research, there are a lot of challenges and uh, we have actually come up with some uh, solutions and uh, I would like to quickly 
uh, take you through that uh, solutions. And uh, the first challenge what always uh, we find is understanding the concepts from both the systems of uh, biology because Ayurveda has its own epistemology and modern biology has a completely different uh, you know, language through which they uh, explain the biology. So for that, uh, we always uh, take the help of uh, Ayurveda scholars and we, uh, so this is just a representation of the uh, different concepts, like say, for example, they have uh, uh, balancing uh, dosha, balancing agni, balancing dhatu. So each of these things we will uh, see in a different, different, different um, uh, context and we will see what are the kind of correlations that you can make, say, for example, digestive capacity for agni or uh, metabolism of different tissues. So this is one of the first step uh, to, to uh, start this uh, integration process. But at the same time, uh, we have uh, another major issue, which uh, is the complex formulations, because these formulations are the tools which you can use when we uh, talk about Ayurveda. Where the problem of these complex formulations, are uh, these are multi-herbal uh, uh, formulations, and you can expect like, you know, 400, uh, 600 uh, components minimum in that, and it can even reach to uh, thousands and uh, you know, ten thousands also. And this has to be studied in their original form because these complex uh, formulations are prepared based on Ayurvedic, uh, you know, pharmacology principles. If you are isolating one, uh, you know, molecule or something, it need not represent the entire, uh, you know. Uh, Ayurvedic uh, understanding of that formulation. So for that, what we generally do is we'll uh, go for an in vitro digestion, simulated in vitro digestion. So this we can further, you know, uh, follow with the uh, conventional fractionation for identification of uh, phytochemicals and all those things. But at the same time, the digest what we are getting here, that uh, simulated in vitro digestion of your gastrointestinal digestion that is happening for this formulation, that digest we believe that can mimic the uh, uh, biological, uh, you know, uh, phenomena in a better way. So we use this digest for further studies, and uh, we have to use all these uh, phytochemistry-based uh, tools for understanding the detailed chemistry of this formulation. So this is really challenging, but we uh, come up with this kind of a model. And further, we need to have some interesting model systems and tools. So I'll just quickly take you through uh, one or two uh, glimpses of our, uh, you know, results that is from TDU. Uh, for example, so this is uh, uh, one of the formulation that is prepared from uh, curcuma and uh, emblica officinal. This is called as Nisha Malagi. So here we have used uh, some models which are uh, enzyme uh, inhibition models where uh, digestive enzymes like alpha amylase, alpha glucosidase, etc. were inhibiting. And the beauty of this study was when we studied this formulation as a whole, what we could observe is this formulation, though turmeric is there, most of the time we will end up saying that it's curcumin, but we could show that turmeric, I mean, this formulation is not just curcumin. We have uh, some other molecules that we are, uh, you know, yet to identify. So basically what I'm trying to say is this kind of a model system where we use something called as in vitro digestion, simulated in vitro digestion, some enzyme assays and some phytochemistry tools to study this formulation. And Another example is uh, a formulation which is used in anti, uh, I mean, you know, treating the uh, uh, diabetes, which is associated with obesity, where we could uh, use model systems like same in vitro digestion, enzyme assays, and you also use some cell models like, you know, 3 d 3 l one studying anti-adipogenic as well as the same uh, uh, lipid accumulation effects on HEPG2. So this has a connection with the non-alcoholic fatty liver because uh, glucose metabolism or diabetes is uh, you know, connected with all these diseases. So this is another example how we can use different model systems. Same way, for example, uh, when it comes to the uh, Ayurvedic nootropics, C. elegans is going to be one uh, important model so that also you can use where the uh, formulation can be directly uh, given to these uh, models. So rather than uh, looking at the uh, effect of a single molecule, uh, we can uh, give, feed this uh, uh, model systems with the uh, formulation. So that will give a different uh, understanding of how these complex formulations are working. Similarly, apart from this uh, C. elegans, we can uh, also use Drosovilla. And this is very interesting model for studying the diet therapies because gut is one of the focus and when gut is a focus then definitely diet is also coming and playing an important role so there this uh, fly model uh, has a lot of uh, importance and you can uh, uh, interestingly you can create obese flies and all those things so this is going to be another important model and also it is very important to see when we study a formulation analyzing the pharmacological networking and biochemical crosstalk so this is also something very very important so for that we uh, 
or use the uh, you know network pharmacology concepts because this is one example for how to tackle the complexity of uh, science kind of a uh, this thing which is uh, you know on which this transdisciplinarity is grounded see for example this is again from nishamal gail quickly finish this uh, we have uh, so many uh, uh, this uh, yellow color uh, things are uh, phytochemicals uh, reported from uh, turmeric and green is phytochemicals reported from amla so you can see this phytochemicals are interacting with this many different targets which are potentially having an important role in diabetes okay and also you can see that the green color on this uh, left side my left side is type 1 diabetes specific and uh, the uh, right uh, hand side is type 2 diabetes specific and the middle one blue color is targets which are commonly seen in type 1 and type 2 diabetes so this is the kind of complexity with just uh, you know a formulation which has only two plans so now imagine that if you have a uh, formulation which has you know 10 or 20 or 70 plans what will be the complexity of the uh, interactions, possible interactions? So we need to address that also through this. And this is also in term, you know, you know giving us uh, some uh, connection or uh, leads to the disease home where the diseases are also in the, uh, you know, interact. And we have several other, yeah, yes, just uh, uh, done, last slide. And now, uh, please, thank you. <laughs> Yeah, so basically it is uh, uh, to say that, uh, you know, breaking the silos and uh, understanding different worldviews and transcending the functional boundaries so that you can have a resurgence of holistic uh, healthcare. So this is the uh, uh, take home message. So it's just, you know, solving a puzzle and we all, uh, you know, need to work together. That's the uh, take home message. And thank you very much. If there are any questions, I can take. Uh, so, sorry, sorry for disturbing you at the end of your talk, but uh, it was really, really interesting uh, as usual. So, do you, is there somebody with question, please? Uh, it's very, very interesting. Thank you. Um, so, uh, I, I wonder if uh, some uh, of your demonstration that you, you do in vitro on enzymes or cells uh, should have to be um, controlled or, or at least uh, uh, confirmed at a uh, clinical level. Yeah. So the reason is that uh, in Ayurveda, well, the beauty is that uh, this is a reverse pharmacology approach. We are actually taking this formulation, which are regularly used in clinics, so that uh, clinical uh, data is already available with us. So using those formulations, we are trying to understand the uh, biological, you know, uh, underpinnings and exploring the uh, network pharmacology. So that is one uh, beauty of that. So we go for it. It's called as reverse pharmacology. <laughs> so that's one, uh, you know, advantage, I would say. Thank you very much. So now we, we are going, if there is no other question, I don't know. No. Okay, so we can uh, welcome Cyril Santer from, uh, from Versailles. Uh, and uh, Cyril, uh, you can probably share your screen. Yes, uh, okay, here. Normally, I think you could see it, it's okay for you? Yes. Yes. Uh, and yes, you, you can start by introducing you first, and uh, yes. then you can start your presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Catherine. Okay, so I am Cyril Santer. I work at Izipka. Izipka is a French school uh, created uh, by Jean-Jacques Guerlain on uh, 1970. And we work and we teach on uh, three fields, um, perfume, cosmetics, and food aroma. So I will show you, I will present you some works uh, I do during my uh, PhD works in collaboration with ICSN, which is a French uh, team from CNRS, and they work on uh, chemistry of natural products. And with the company, the cosmetic company Clarence, uh, we use a lot of uh, plant extract in uh, their final products. So I will talk about SFE extraction with uh, supercritical fluid, SFC uh, chromatography with supercritical fluids, and their online definition to extract and characterize uh, some lipids. 
So to begin, just a few words about uh, supercritical fluid. So uh, each uh, compound have uh, three uh, states, uh, three physical states, solid, liquid, and gas, uh, as you can see here on the graph. And here there is a triple point. Uh, and here is a critical point. On up to this uh, this temperature on this pressure, pressure we are in a supercritical field, and we have some uh, physical uh, properties very interesting for extraction and for chromatography, uh, such as density, which is closed as a liquid, so it's very interesting for solvent power on extraction with uh, SFE. Uh, the viscosity is close to a gas, so uh, we have less uh, pressure drop for quick analysis in chromatography and uh, in uh, extraction. And the diffusivity uh, increases the efficiency of the, of the method. So we focus on CO2, which is uh, the most used uh, solvent in SFE, actually. Uh, why? Because uh, it's a green solvent. It's a byproduct from uh, bioethanol and metallization production. Uh, the critical point is very easy to use and it's important in extraction of natural products because the temperature is uh, 31 degrees and the pressure is 74 bars. So we have no degradation of the metabolites when we extract with uh, this type of, uh, of method. Uh, we reduce the energy consumption. We have a low cost on the high purity of the product. And what is very interesting, uh, after the extraction, CO2 uh, go to gas fast, so we have no uh, residual solvent inside our extract. So it's very interesting for cosmetics and other use. Uh, CO2 is rather apolar. Uh, it has a polarity close to hexane, for example. So it could be a little bit complicated to extract some um, polar compound. And in this case, we use some co-solvent, and the major uh, co-solvent used actually is ethanol. Uh, CO2 is miscible to with a large uh, number of solvent. So for chromatography, we have a large range of solvent uh, which can be used. Uh, CO2 is known, uh, major known for the extraction of uh, the removal of caffeine in coffee, uh, replacing a dichloromethane uh, technique. But in France, we use it for uh, remove uh, cork taste. Uh, there is uh, a molecule inside the cork uh, which is named uh, trichloranisole, and uh, this, uh, pro this molecule gives uh, the cork taste to, to wine, so it's uh, interesting to remove it, and we can do with uh, CO2. Uh, we can use CO2 to, uh, for textile dyeing process. Uh, Nike Society work with uh, this process. Uh, uh, with no use of water and no use of uh, solvent, toxic solvent, so it's very interesting. And another application is the waterless and uh, dryerless cleaning. Uh, we can use CO2 to remove, uh, uh, to clean uh, clothes, for example, because the major uh, cause of, uh, of, uh, of uh, impurities or, or on, the, on the textile are lipid of, uh, lipidic. Okay, so three parts in my presentation. The first is about uh, SFE paper extracts. Uh, we work with a French perfumer named uh, Osmo Art. And the idea is uh, to extract different papers. So here you can see on the presentation, we have a family with two papers, so gender paper on two species, uh, nigrum and uh, bourbonense. On the other family is false paper, uh, uh, with the uh, Sancho papers, which is a, a Japanese paper uh, with lemon notes. You know, so in perfumery, is uh, very interesting uh, to have a, a French aspect of the perfume. And the other false paper is Timut. So we try a lot of different conditions, and we define that the best condition for extraction for us is uh, 300 bars, 50 degrees, and 45 minutes for uh, extraction in dynamic mode. So we obtain different extract, 
effect, as uh, you can see on the on the screen. We work with white paper, black paper, and red paper. And here you can see the false paper Timut on uh, on green Sancho. Uh, it's interesting to to see on a red paper you can extract uh, a little bit the color, so it uh, means that. Uh, uh, there is some lipophilic uh, colorant inside, uh, and the same thing on uh, raspberry uh, paper. In terms of uh, analysis, uh, we are doing some statistical treatment of the data after GC analysis of the extract. And we have a, a small surprise because you have here a cluster with uh, all the true papers and uh, here normally a cluster with a false paper and we find inside the false paper uh, the paper uh, bourbonense uh, which normally have to be here in the upper part so we are uh, investigate to understand why uh, this paper is uh, with false uh, paper clusters the second part is uh, about the uh, definition of SFC and SFC. Uh, we work uh, on two matrix, uh, sunflower and the spinach. Sunflower to analyze uh, some fatty acids uh, inside, and the spinach for more polar lipids. Uh, I will show you which lipid just a little bit later. So, at school, we have uh, this equipment. So, we have a part for SF, uh, SFC, which uh, look uh, an uh, HPLC uh, equipment, but we have this part, uh, which is different with HPLC, to pressurize CO2 and to keep some pressure inside the system during the analysis. Uh, for detection, we have a UV detector on the mass spectrometer, which is a triple quadrupole MS uh, uh, detector. And for the extraction, uh, this is uh, the picture of the extraction, we develop uh, a Swiss Knight uh, uh, equipment with different functions. Uh, I detail them here so we can make some uh, countercurrent fraction action with a column of uh, two meter lens here on the on the right part. We have an oven to, to work uh, until 150 degrees uh, and we have small extraction cells. So it's uh, dedicated to R&D uh, development because uh, our cells uh, are beginning to 25 milliliters to 100 milliliters. So it's very interesting for industrial in France or other countries to try this technology with a small quantity of plant. So we can uh, make some uh, SFE, uh, supercritical fluid extraction, but PLE, uh, we can uh, use uh, pressurized uh, liquid to, uh, to extract different plant too. We have two pumps, uh, one for the CO2, of course, and one for the co-solvent, and we can use all the co-solvent uh, we want. And we have a pressure, the max pressure is 1000 bars, so uh, it's very interesting for uh, R&D, but it's complicated because we have not industrial plants which can reach uh, this pressure actually, and we hope in the in the future we can uh, go to this pressure because there is some interesting uh, thing uh, to extract at these pressures. Here you can see another cell, so it's a particular extraction cell, it's a 100 milliliter, uh, but in the same time we use uh, CO2 or uh, liquid extraction, we can uh, have some ultrasound directly inside the, the extraction cells and uh, we can combine the, the two technologies uh, for uh, uh, green extraction. So an example for uh, sunflower extract, you can see um, on the left uh, the density of the, the solvent uh, linked to the, the pressure. And we work at uh, 60 degrees for this uh, experiment. And you can see on the right the, the yield, the extraction yields we obtain with this uh, technology. So at low pressure, we have a low yield. But when we go, we reach to uh, 800 bars, for example, we have a yield of uh, 30%. So it's very interesting to, to obtain some oils or extract uh, from, uh, from some flower. And we can see we have a link uh, between pressure, uh, density, and uh, solvent power. 
In terms of analytical paths, uh, we uh, make the definition between the two systems with uh, two loops uh, uh, part. Uh, one of the loop uh, work with SFE at uh, the initial time. The other part work with SFC. And when we want to analyze, we switch the two positions. So this part in blue uh, work with SFE and the part in red work on, uh, with uh, SF, uh, SFE. Uh, you can see here a uh, chromatogram for the three main component uh, we find uh, in, uh, in these oils, three uh, fatty acids, uh, palmitic, oleic, and leonoleic. And you can see here in blue the beginning of the extraction after uh, seven uh, minutes, after 14 minutes, and after 21 minutes. And you can see to decrease the concentration of the, of these uh, fatty acids and you can draw some curves to uh, to manage the, the extraction on the cinetic of the, the extraction so uh, for this first part we use a short method only to analyze um, fatty acids but the interest uh, is to develop another method so we work with uh, icsn as i uh, said on, on the beginning they develop uh, a method they publish this method to analyze uh, lipids by uh, by class and we just uh, modify a little bit uh, the, the size of the colon to have uh, less pressure inside uh, the colon and you can see uh, the separations are, are very uh, similar very close you can see uh, here chlorophyll because in, uh, in spinach, we have a lot of chlorophyll, but it's quite fine here. Some lipids, some uh, uh, glyceride with uh, one sugar, glyceride with two sugars, and phospholipids here. You can uh, see here some, uh, some sugar, and you can uh, analyze or manage the quantity of chlorophyll you have in, uh, in, your, in your extract uh, directly uh, without human uh, manipulation. So uh, in the spinach, we know we have uh, different uh, polar lipids. So for the extraction, we work with a high percentage of, uh, of ethanol, about 20 to 30 uh, percent with uh, with the CO2, and uh, we can see the we can do the same thing with uh, fatty acid and uh, uh, manage and uh, draw some curves during the extraction uh, to. Uh, which uh, a time of uh, 10 minutes between uh, each extraction and for the detection uh, we use a positive mode to have some headaches uh, such as uh, with uh, uh, sodium or with uh, ammonium and um, the system used to um, to collect the extract is a little bit more complicated than the first I, I show you in the, in the beginning because we have no uh, two loop in this system, but we have 12 loops, uh, and we can use to uh, to stock uh, extract uh, 10 uh, 10 u uh, 10 uh, 10 loops. And uh, for the moment, we do uh, the analysis after the extraction because we can't manage uh, the 2D uh, 2D uh, analysis with uh, our actual software. Okay, on the third part, it's uh, to help us to uh, analyze um, and to uh, characterize some, some product. Uh, when we use GC, we have uh, electronic ionization, which is very interesting because we have a huge uh, um, library of product with the fragmentation and it's very useful to identify compound. Uh, so we try we try to 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 I fund the the chromatography with this type of uh, of detector. Uh, so here you can see uh, the idea on the on the system. So we have the SFC here, and we use uh, the GCMS uh, without modification, and we introduce the flow of uh, of the extract or the. Uh, uh, directly inside the injector with uh, a part here to uh, um, 
to manage the temperature because when we, we uh, depressurize CO2, we have an, uh, an endothermic uh, phenomena, so it could be a, a problem. Uh, just uh, to see some chromatogram obtained with, um, with this uh, type of uh, high finition, uh, here you have a mix of different uh, FEM, uh, so fatty acid methyl esters, and uh, another with a different the lens of uh, carbon chain and you can see here the score the similarity score when we uh, try to identify with the software uh, and they are very good because we we are from uh, 84 percent to a uh, year uh, 90 uh, 93 so uh, the recognition is very uh, uh, very uh, good. Uh, we have published some uh, some method to uh, to use. I seen in the, in the precedent presentation uh, molecular network um, at uh, at CNRS. Uh, they develop uh, their own uh, software, free software for. Uh, uh, molecular network, and you can uh, use some. Uh, Ionization impact data from GC uh, directly inside the uh, molecular network to obtain the, the same thing of clusters on uh, on identification. And what on the point is very interesting in their uh, their software when you use the NPS, for example, you have different cluster. Uh, so inside the cluster, you know uh, the, the molecules are have a closed structure. But uh, between a different clusters, you don't know exactly uh, if they are closed or not. And uh, on the CNRS software, you have a TSNI algorithm, uh, which uh, gives you this uh, information. Or you, can, uh, you can know if you have similarity uh, between uh, different uh, clusters. Okay, so in term, in, uh, in conclusion, uh, we can uh, have some uh, statistical information uh, using uh, uh, PCA, for example, or ACH, uh, such as I, I present to cluster papers uh, on for quality control. For example, if you receive a new paper, you can uh, perform the extract and submit uh, in the statistical data to be sure you have the right uh, paper uh, you buy. Uh, first results for uh, hyphenation are very encouraging, but we have to improve the robustness of the, the multi-loop uh, system. Uh, we just begin to develop uh, series uh, one or, or two years. Uh, with SFE on uh, SFC uh, online hyphenation, uh, we can analyze other lipid. We have normally no limits uh, for uh, for lipids with uh, the method uh, and we can work on uh, other matrix uh, to see how it could work with uh, other metabolites for example uh, the first result for uh, SFC uh, electronic impact uh, are encouraging too but it's uh, a subject uh, working from a long long years in different labs and uh, it uh, seems to be uh, more complicating uh, that uh, we think. Okay, and to finish, just an acknowledgement uh, to, our, um, to our financer because uh, we have a project, Lipocosm, with uh, Clarence on uh, CNRS, as you can see here, uh, to extract lipid for cosmetics using CO2. And we have other uh, partners uh, for the biologic activity, for example, with a 3D painting of, uh, of skin here, uh, here for the scale up uh, of, uh, of extraction we made in, in laboratory. And Stanley Farm is very interesting for the vectorization of the active because in cosmetics, uh, you have a lot of uh, hydrophilic extracts. So it's easy to try some uh, tubo tests uh, to, to define activities such as uh, antioxidant uh, whitening or other. But with a CO2 extract, we have a lipophilic extract. Uh, so we can't make uh, this test in uh, in water water base. Uh, so we have to to define or to try other uh, possibilities. So Stanley Farm uh, allow us to to make uh, micro nano emulsion for vectorization, and we use it on a topics uh, topics way with uh, CTE Botech. And thank you very much for your attention.
thank you to you, uh, Cyril. It was uh, very interesting uh, and very promising because a uh, very uh, novel uh, technique. Um, are there any questions, please? <laughs> Yes, Mohan, uh, yeah, please. Yeah, I am uh, Dr. Mohan Dongare. Uh, it's a very interesting, uh, uh, I mean, presentation and uh, work using supercritical CO2 for extraction of certain value, valuable lipids from paper. Actually, I just wanted to know because I'm not from this field, but can we use normal liquid CO2 for any valuable process uh, for extraction not yet um, uh, liquid co2 is more used for uh, cleaning process for example i described as uh, the beginning but it could be uh, an interesting way to extract uh, uh, i don't test it uh, for the moment in uh, in extraction okay. but yeah why i'm asking this we... question in india particularly we have distilleries uh, ethanol yeah. distilleries and we get nearly something like 25 to 30 tons of liquid CO2. Uh, people are uh, extracting and collecting and keeping it and they don't know what to do with that because only for it goes for uh, your, uh, I mean, uh, liquid drinks or whatever you say, that is uh, carboni carbonized drinks and little bit for welding. So we want to find out a good application for liquid CO2. Okay, so you collect CO2 between your process, if I yeah, will understand. Yeah. You see in the yeah. fermentation, we get very good uh, CO2. And we have a yes. process for collecting and uh, I mean storing the liquid form. Uh, in France, we know uh, Messer company on the air liquid company. Yeah. Messer is working uh, with um, uh, 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 bioethanol producers, I don't uh, remember its name, but they collect CO2 from bioethanol process. Yeah, yeah, I see. Uh, and to use for extraction for us, uh, you can use as a um, cryo uh, solvent in uh, in GC when you 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 need to focus some uh, molecules uh, with uh, such as a terpene, for example, um, and. Uh, I think it uh, it could be interesting if you are if you have a huge quantity of this solvent to contact this type of company to know yeah. if yeah. there uh, there could be interesting to collect your CO2 and use it after uh, in medical field or other field. Yeah, wherever I mean, you see, we want to find out a very good application for liquid CO2 in chemical industries or any pharmaceutical industries or any other industry where it can be used as a normal solvent and we will have some advantage. So I will write to you, we can communicate. Okay. That's fine. Uh, fine, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Cyril. Uh, time is running, so I had a question, but uh, it will be for another day. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we will uh, uh, welcome uh, Varsha Kalika from, uh, from Mumbai University. And thank you again, it was very nice. Yes, Arsha, it's your turn. Uh, you can uh, you can share your screen if you want. Yes, can you Good. see my screen? Yes, uh, yes, yes. Uh, maybe you can put it on a uh, uh, white screen. Can you see it? Yes, perfectly. Okay. It's fine. Okay. Thank you. Great. So, uh, it's your turn, and you can try yes. start by introducing. Okay, so uh, thank you, Catherine, and uh, thanks to the uh, organizers of this event. Uh, it's been a great, great pleasure and uh, an intellectual treat to hear my earlier speakers. And um, I will be changing gears from chemistry to healthcare to personal care and microbiome or microbiology, uh, because that is what is our area and that is what we have been working actively with. Um, So what basically I will be taking you through is the journey of cosmetics, the past, present and future 
the GMP or the CGMP practices and the changes in cosmetics that are set to change the face of cosmetic microbiology and that are changed that are set to change our face in the coming years. So this is what I will run you through. This, this is the flow of my talk. And uh, coming to cosmetics, all of us have used cosmetics at some point in time and they could be called very well as mixtures that are applied on basically the skin surfaces. And uh, these days we probably say that they are used to give or enhance the appearance or protect us from say UV or from any other harmful radiations or harmful chemicals. However, if we go back in history, cosmetics were a means of expression. They were used for rituals and they were also used or used as a means of empowerment and at times survival. Now is the use of cosmetics new? Obviously the answer is no. We know that minerals and pigments have been used by um, Neanderthal cousins around 50,000 years ago. And uh, not only men and women, we had also the pharaohs of Egypt who exfoliated and they scrubbed, as did the Indians who explored them and utilized Ayurveda to beautify themselves and look good. China was also um, along, racing along with the Egyptians and the Indians and the Greeks and the Romans. And here in China also staining of fingernails with gum arabica, egg white, beeswax was a way to represent the social class. So cosmetics is not new to us. We have started with minerals and we are going or proceeding, marching towards microbiome. Now, <clears throat> makeup or cosmetics dominated both the sexes, that is men and women until the 17th century, until a phenomena called as great male renunciation came into picture and where men's not only dressing changed, but makeup was looked down upon and it was looked up to something that only women, it is the women's forte. And that is where the makeup in men or use of cosmetics in men went down. Now, besides makeup for um, or cosmetic dressing for um, you know multiple purposes like empowerment, there are stories of use of cosmetics. For example, the Aqua Tofana who was made by Gulia Tofana. And she was the one who helped, um, you know, around 600 women murder their husbands. Obviously, this is not the recommended use of cosmetics, but this is a strange story of where cosmetics can land into. And she used to mix arsenic along with some other compounds in the face powders, which was applied to the women's face. And when the, it, it was actually the kiss of death for the husbands. And that is another very strange use of cosmetics that is reported in history. A number of books have been reported um, or written in, um, in and about cosmetics. And uh, these are two books which I would recommend. One of them is available online while the other one, the online version, while the other one is um, available on uh, any other e-commerce websites. So number of books, so it has been cosmetics and makeups have been used by a royalty. They have been, um, uh, they have gone down and probably used by prostitutes, but the dawn of cosmetic use finally arrived, you know, sometime in the second part of the 19th century. And this was when the industrial revolution took place and you had advances in chemistry and you had chemical fragrances coming up. You have preservatives coming up and you had the control over not only the manufacture, but also the uh, preservation of the cosmetic products which came into being. Uh, late in the roaring 20s, I would say you had glamorous movie stars, moreover in the 1930s, who finally brought cosmetics to mass merchandise market. And these were sold in department stores and other venues. And now you know where all we can find uh, cosmetics and how far we have reached. Coming a little bit to the market size of cosmetics and the dominance of cosmetics, the figure speaks all. And I have derived this from one of the market researches, uh, which is available freely online. And uh, I would just go to say that cosmetics have become an indispensable feature of modern lifestyle of individuals. So whether in lockdown or whether not in lockdown, uh, in lockdown, we use the mascaras and the eyeliners. And when there was no lockdown, probably the entire face makeup was in vogue. Now, the moment we talk about market size, the moment we talk about the use of cosmetics for the masses, obviously what comes into the picture is good manufacturing practices. 
and uh, GMP or good manufacturing pra practices or CGMP, which is current good manufacturing practice practices. These have resulted from a long history of the need of consumer protection. So GMP regulations are issued by the Federal Food, Drug and Cosmetic Act. Each country has its own uh, guidelines for GMP or CGMP. And uh, also India also has its own guideline. And what I will be focusing on in the chemical and the microbial domain is obviously the microbial domain, because that is where we have been actively working and um, our lab has been actively contributing towards it. Now, microbes, when they are looked as contaminants, now till now the perception was that microbes are inevitably, they are contaminants, they are something that you need to get rid of. So here are a few pointers which you will understand that where do microbes come into the cosmetic preparation? So the use of contaminated water more over than raw materials is the main ingredient or the main contributor to the microbes or microorganisms in water. Besides that, if the equipment or the instrument line where the cosmetics are being manufactured and tested is not in proper condition, the manufacturing conditions are poor, obviously you will have contaminants. Besides this, microbes also find or existing microbes are encouraged to grow because of the composition of the substances that exist in the uh, cosmetic formulation. So you have oils, you have water, you have, um, uh, you know, some plant actives, you have waxes, you can have other essential components or vitamins for that matter, which will enhance not only our skin tone, but will also boost the organism, the growth of the organisms, which we do not want. And hence, we need an effective preservative system. Besides that, packaging also contributes if the packaging is not done appropriately, obviously, it will, um, it will be another cause of introducing microorganisms and microbial contaminants. If all this is in place, probably poor shipping and storage conditions will affect or will contribute to the microbial load of cosmetics. And finally, consumers use. The end users also contribute significantly to the cosmetics. And how do they act? Uh, how do they add to the microbial load? If we are sharing cosmetics, remember we are sharing microbes, we are sharing germs, sharing of lipstick, sharing of um, makeup accessories is a strict no because you we are kind of sharing our skin flora with someone else and their skin flora with us. Adding water or saliva to cosmetics. So suppose you are wearing a lipstick and you have a cold drink and after having a cold drink, you put back the lipstick the um, sugars in the cold drink and the water content of the cold drink is getting transferred into your lipstick, keep that in mind. As a result of which, of course, you will be enhancing the microbial growth in the uh, product. So also improper storage of cosmetics by the consumer will also allow microorganisms to grow faster. Not only that, it will also boost the breakdown of preservatives, which is obviously not recommended. Hand hygiene. We have all been practicing hand hygiene um, due to this during this pandemic. And that is another way in which microbes are contributed into or find place into the cosmetics. So there are various microbial enumerate methods of enumeration and sampling. We have the FDA, the ISO, the ASTM, the pharmacopias, all of which elaborately tell us the way in which a sample needs to be analyzed, the way in which the sample has to be prepared. And I will not go into the details because it runs into a lot of pages. This is just an extract of what they say. But there is something called as acceptable limit. So what is acceptable? So you have the TAC as we call it, which is the total aerobic microbe count for the children under the age of three should be below 100 CFU or 100 colony forming units per gram of ML. So you have the, um, uh, the, the powders and the creams and the lotions that are used for babies and the recommended count or the acceptable limit is 100 CFU. For all other cosmetic products, it is around 1000 CFU per gram or 1000 colony forming units per gram or ML. Now, remember when we are talking about colony forming units or when we are talking about these bacteria which can form colonies, the presence of E. coli, Escherichia coli, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and S. aureus is a big no. None of these permit the presence or allow the presence of these organisms in the cosmetic uh, formulations or the final formulations. Now, if this is the case that we want, we do not want the uh, number of organisms to exceed beyond a certain limit, then obviously what is needed is preservatives. 
And if you take a look at the preservatives then and now, as I put it, we are, trans we are traveling from natural preservatives, then we have come into synthetic preservatives, and now we are once again going into the era of natural preservatives, and we want what are called as natural preservatives. This is just a gist of what the Indian Standard Cosmetic Raw Materials list of preservative has. It runs into pages once again and is classified into synthetic and natural preservatives. This is just a glimpse of what synthetic preservatives will be, and they range from organohalogen compounds and aldehydes, glycol ethers and parabens. Most of them are not preferred for a simple reason is they have they have side effects on the user. They have they, they impart their own effects on the users and hence it is not recommended. This is one of the site called RAPEX, which is called as Rapid Alert System by the European Commission. And it's an early warning system for safety management and finding information about dangerous cosmetic products sold in the EU markets. So these dangerous cosmetic products, they may be having um, say certain substances which are banned or certain substances whose use is restricted and they are under the cosmetic legislation and this site will give you a detailed information about these non-food products. So if chemical preservatives are a big no, then people moved on from chemical preservatives to natural preservatives. They enable the use, the use of the buzzword or the natural and the organic uh, word could be used for cosmetics in that case. And some of them are benzoic acid and antioxidants also, which have been, which have found as natural preservatives. What we in our lab are advocating is something called as Ayurpreser actives. Now, what are Ayurpreser actives? I have taken only three examples here. And here we have the cinnamon leaf oil. We have the Indian germanium or the palm rosa. And finally, the curry leaf oil. All of them have been familiar in the, of course, cinnamon and curry leaf have been familiar in the Indian cooking system. And if you see to summarize their properties, I would say that all of them have an antibacterial action or antimicrobial or germicidal action. They are antiseptic, they are stimulants, they have astringent property and they have rejuvenating properties also. So here, what we are trying to come up with is a formulation with Ayurvedic preserve active. So they will not only preserve my, Ayur, my formulation, my personal care formulation, but it will also have its own contribution in enhancing skin health and skin rejuvenation. So curry leaf is also, curry leaves are used extensively in South of India and even in Maharashtra or the Western coast where I come from. Uh, citrus peels and lemongrass is also extensively used and the use of citrus peels and lemongrass is also advocated in a number of um, personal care preparations. It is also bactericidal and lemongrass as all of us are aware of is a deodorant, is a strong deodorant. It is also known to have cardiac calming properties and, um, you know, in general, a relaxing property, which will obviously give a glow or add a glow to your face. Now, from Ayurveda to recent uh, companies who are into uh, plant preservatives, so we have something called as plant, plant servative, which is by a company called Roche, and they are they have come up with a preservative from the honeysuckle plant, and they have, they have been using it extensively in their formulations. Now, one more um, problem as a microbiologist that we see is the use of antibacterial or the uh, uh, antibacterial versus preservative versus a biocide. And if we are using antimicrobial compounds in, in a particular formulation, so preservatives are something different and antimicrobials are something different. If we are using an antimicrobial, remember there is a problem of resistance around the corner and all of us are facing it in one way or the other to combat microbial resistance. So we are moving on from chemical to natural preservatives to preservative free cosmetics now. And there are various ways in, this, in which this can be done. And we have the ultra high treatment procedures where you heat and cool the product like the way you do it for milk and other dairy products, you do it for cosmetics as well. Then we have something called as airless packaging, which is also available uh, world over, wherein you reduce the exposure of the cosmetic product to the air as a result of which you reduce the contamination of the product as well. Now, going a step further into generalized cosmetics, now the era dawns upon what is called as next generalized personal beauty market or we do away with the concept of one size fit all and we want something called as personalized, uh, personalized concept uh, cosmetics. 
and why is this coming up because there is a rising awareness about personalized beauty products so you know one size doesn't fit all there is a lot of genomic science which is contributing molecular biology which is contributing um, immensely to personalized beauty market and this is probably the dawn or the next future of science uh, next future of cosmetics moving one step further when we spoke when we speak about molecular biology and um, microbiology we can uh, microbiome is something that is inevitable and now we look at microorganisms as our friends rather than foes and this particular news featured just in this month wherein scientists in pune and bangalore are studying the skin microbiome of indians uh, because it is reported that indians have a relatively they studied around 800 volunteers and what they found that indians had a relatively low mortality rate and this was something to do with the protection that was provided by the unique microbiota on the indian skin not only on the indian skin in the oral as well as navel cavities of the uh, indian volunteers that was studied so this further enhances the role of microbiome uh, in in not only looking good but in our skin health and health in general so the human microbiome project as all of us are aware was launched in 2008 and if we have to summarize about the micro the load of microorganism that each one of us carries forget the fact that you have you take a bath in the morning or you take bath three times in a day at least 10 cells of one are microorganisms so if an individual is weighing 100 kgs remember he has one to three kgs of microbes on his body as his natural flora uh, natural flora and what are they doing they are enhancing our health they are helping us protect or they are help, they are protecting us from the environment they are protecting us from the uh, colonization of pathogens as they are called is and now people scientists manufacturers they are designing health enhancing skin care products that have live bacteria so now we are not looking at uh, bacterial extracts we are not looking at microalgal extracts what we are looking at is live bacteria we are looking at prebiotics and probiotics for skin so far we spoke about prebiotic and probi probiotics for uh, the gut microbiota now they are talking about pre and probiotics for your skin there are a lot of mncs as well as startups also who are investigating and investing in bacterial treatment so maybe it is combating the acne inf infection it is probably combating eczema and there are a lot of papers which are coming up and people are now suddenly interested and in looking up to the microorganisms which colonize and which are found on our skin but remember there are challenges once again to this new era or new new field which is coming up and our lab has been actively working in understanding these challenges and trying to find out solutions to the use of these organisms uh, for um, enhancing our skin tone and our our looks so there are various regulations including the european union regulations and they do not permit the intentional addition of bacteria in cosmetics it is not permitted at all so then in that case how do we add the beneficial bacteria you know if we are adding the beneficial bacteria how do we preserve the formulation because it is obvious that the moment i add the bacteria the dosage of the bacteria on my skin has to be limited how how do i limit their growth how do i limit uh, or how do i restrict the other organisms from coming in and maintain this as a pure culture so that it won't become unstable or spoiled another major challenge that we are trying to address is the testing efficacy so how do we test the personal care formulations for their effects on skin because if we are using cultured human cell models in the lab they are sterile now if we are using a a, a micro a, a, a microbiome or we are using a group of microorganisms to see the effect on the skin obviously we are going to contaminate the cell line so how do we start or how do we design the testing efficacy then there is another concept which is coming up is that you have dormant lactobacillus inside a protective microcapsule and you just break in and you spread it on your skin so when the cream is rubbed or when the lotion is rubbed the capsule will break and the bacteria are activated now this is one of the ways in which you know the bacteria can be preserved and uh, you don't you don't need a preservative because the bacteria are already in a sterile form and these are the three challenges and towards which our lab has been actively working and to end with i would like to say i would like to quote um, the famous paleontologist who says that 
what you see is that the most outstanding feature of life's history is a constant domination by bacteria. And our lab has been witnessing it and uh, trying to make them make the foes as friends and working them towards making us and making the skin look and feel good. So with this, I thank you all for your hearing. And if you have to um, reach me, this is my email ID. Uh, I'm sorry, Catherine, I forgot to introduce right in the beginning. I'm Dr. Varsha Kelkarmane, and I'm heading the Department of Biotechnology at University of Mumbai. Uh, we have been active in various fields, right from bioprospecting to translational research. We have a tie up with um, a, a company, a personal care company, and that is where uh, all of this research uh, comes into picture. There are results which I, I cannot present because of the clause of confidentiality, but I have tried to present as much as possible to probably highlight the role of uh, microorganisms in skin and healthcare. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Varsha. In fact, I had some questions, but you already answered them, <laughs> so it's, it's marvelous. And uh, is there, uh, are there any questions, uh, please, for Varsha? Yes, yes. Oh, yes, I'm Dr. Mohan. I have heard the lecture of uh, Kelkar. She started with uh, our ancient uh, mineral to oh, cosmetics. And then the, she switched over to microbes and now she wants to put microbes on her body. Uh, I just wanted to ask, I mean, uh, uh, you see, when you started with minerals, now minerals are very good. They don't, I mean, uh, minerals in the sense they are mostly oxides or uh, metal oxides and things like that. So, I mean, how suddenly we have changed to the microbes and uh, it is quite dangerous also to put microbes on your skin just to see that you look better. Uh, what I say that now with the new nanotechnology, <clears throat> I mean, the minerals can be nicely uh, brought down to pigment level and those can be used like, for example, you have nano uh, TiO2 for UV protection. So you don't have to go for some kind of uh, uh, microbes where you do not know what kind of uh, reactions you will have. You see, it's, uh, I mean, uh, science-wise, it's very, very interesting uh, to find out, but actual practice, I think we are playing with something like, uh, I don't know, I mean, how to look at that. Okay, so yes, this is an obvious reaction that uh, I have been um, getting or I have been hearing, but uh, just, to, just for your information, there are companies like L'Oreal and Johnson & Johnson and other MNCs who are already very active in it. Uh, firstly, the use of uh, oxides, metal oxides, nanoparticles, which have been abundantly used as skin protecting uh, in your UV or UV protector skin creams. Um, probably we are not aware of the effect that they have in, uh, in a long term, you know, uh, what effect do they have long term on our skin? So are they, they are they're known to be absorbed in the skin and what is their fate in the body is not known. And in regards to the use of organisms on your skin, we are already harboring more than required organisms uh, on our skin. The point here that I'm trying to make is the way you use prebiotics, the way you use probiotics to enhance your gut flora, we are doing the same way. We are trying to enhance the skin flora to have protection against uh, maybe an infection. And this is a proved result that it is an easier way to combat acne rather than using an antibiotic or rather than using an antifungal agent. So you of see, course- No, 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 will... what I say, we just use soap when you are I mean, taking bath. Why do you use soap? Because it's alkaline, it kills all the bacteria and everything. And then you want to, you are asking us to put bacteria again or by skin. Oh, I think, yeah. uh, you know, there is a lot. If you have, if you share your email ID, I think uh, there is a need to change the way to look at bacteria. And um, I can share a few papers yeah. with you so that, uh, you know, you get I'm more insights into I'm organism. a scientist working for the last 50 years in science. So I know what are the bacteria, the other things. You see, it's, uh, sometimes, I mean, people uh, in the, thinking that it's a new area, it's quite uh, interesting, but you see, you have to see that the, how it will affect the whole thing. You see, people will end up with using some kind of bacteria which they will not be able to control. And we have faced this uh, COVID because of that only. It is better not to play with such dangerous things. So nano, nanotechnology is equally dangerous if I can no, tell you. No, you're no, a scientist, no, so you're aware that. of it. 
So no, I don't no. think I don't want to get Please. into the debate yeah, of sure, whether sure, microorganisms sure, sure, are good sure. or bad. Yeah. Uh, you will have your own views, and we will have. Not my own views. These are scientific so, views. Of course, of course. So uh, we are talking Please. science. We are not talking in air. Thank you. Yes, we, we can go on with this discussion a, a bit later because we have a round table and Barsha will uh, uh, go on with this topic if you want afterwards. And now it's my turn to, to present my, my presentation and then we will go on uh, to the round table. But just before uh, the, the starting the round table, we will have a, um, a group picture of all the, the um, the speaker, speakers, so that we can take a, a picture of all of us. Thank you. So I'm gonna share my screen. Going to this. Okay. And uh, oops, oops, oops. Mm -mm -mm. Hey, Catherine, we see the slides. Ah, pardon. Uh, parce que moi, je suis perdu. Moi, je me vois pas. Bon, uh, ça se fait que je ne me vois pas. <laughs> Maybe just go back to your uh, PowerPoint and then put full screen. I think it will do it. Yes, okay. Thank you. Okay. So thank you very much. And uh, so I, I will. Uh, um, I am uh, Professor Benito, and I am uh, working uh, um, in the Department of Pharmacy in the University of Bordeaux. I've been working on uh, phytoestrogens from food for ages, and um, um, then uh, I will present you our last work on. Uh, the exposure of the French population to, to phytoestrogens in this uh, talk. I just want also to say that I am very uh, interested in, um, in uh, food supplements. And, um, and uh, uh, I would like, I, I developed some uh, courses on food supplements and I would like to share them with uh, Indian people. So we are actually working on such a project with some of the people that are involved in this presentation. Uh, so uh, let's go to, to my talk and uh, we will go first for, by, uh, from an introduction. We will talk about the traditional making of legumes. Then we will talk about the modern making, the modern exposure to isoflavones. And then we will talk about the potential health effects of these uh, compounds before going to modern solutions. So as an introduction, I would, uh, we will talk first uh, about the advantage of growing soy and also how it can prevent uh, itself from its predators. So the advantage of growing soybean are numerous because it's a marine and fungus that form root nodules. And these nodules are able to fix nitrogen in soils and also in plants. And the plant has been used as green manure in crop field rotations for ages. And uh, so it also produces protective compounds that allow reducing crop protection products. And uh, it is also rich in protein with good amino acid profiles, except for methionine deficiency. And it is also rich in polyunsaturated fatty acids. So how such a miraculous plant can resist to its predators in fact, it developed uh, a long time uh, many different uh, uh, anti-nutritional factors like oligosaccharides that induce uh, platulences, tannins and phytic acids that reduce mineral absorption, lipooxygenase that reduce lipid digestion, protease inhibitors like canids or Bonnenberg factors that reduce protein digestion, uh, emaglutinin disturbing oxygen blood transportation, saponins that allow uh, protein to pass the internal, internal intestinal barrier like aller allergens, and phytolexins that reduce microbial uh, attacks like, and these are, for example, the glycosylated isoflavones. All the first anti-nutritional factors are sensitive to heat, 
But uh, the isoflavones levels that attract uh, root symbionts that reduce predators' fertility and that induce goiters are resistant to heat, but they are soluble in water. So let's go now through the traditional making, uh, the tofu making, some traditional recipes, and tempeh making. So here is a report by uh, Kane Twentland, uh, who went to the Dibao Banshi province of China. And uh, uh, she managed to report the traditional tofu making. So the first step is dehulling the seeds and uh, uh, then to separate the envelopes from the seed. Then uh, the seeds are soaked uh, for 15 minutes in cold water before being crowned, rounded uh, and in a paste. This paste is then added with water and uh, cooked on a light wood fire for uh, more than one hour until uh, boiling. And then it is kept uh, to, to cool down at room temperature before adding nigari, that is a curdling agent. Then the curdle is poured on a wooden frame with a, a bottom uh, uh, with hole, and uh, then uh, it is pressed to eliminate all the cooking water, and uh, uh, then cut in small pieces before being fried. So during the cooking, uh, two hours cooking, the isoflavones can leak into the water, and during tofu pressing, isoflavones are also eliminated with uh, the cooking water. And therefore, when we look at the exposure of uh, rural adult women uh, in China that had uh, um, conserved the traditional tofu making, you can see that they are mostly exposed to quite low level of isoflavones that are below 15 milligrams per day. And when we follow the isoflavones in tofu following these recipes, you can see that isoflavones can be removed here uh, Oops, um, there is only less than 35% uh, remaining of the initial rate. And uh, probably that the high isof uh, isoflavone exposure uh, we have today is a modern feature. So if we look now at uh, other recipes uh, of tofu, nato, miso, or tempeh, you can see here that most of uh, these um, recipes include uh, water, simmering, cooking uh, with, in renewed water, and all the time the cooking water is discarded. And because it is discarded, the, element, the isoflavones were always removed in the traditional recipes. Here is another um, uh, recipe that we could follow. Uh, this is a, a traditional tempeh making, tempeh from uh, Indonesia. And uh, we follow Nuradi Robert uh, while doing uh, her preparation. And you can see that this preparation involves water rinsing, boiling, and soaking in cooking water, what, which is uh, then eliminated. And when we follow the isoflavones during this process, you can find here that we were uh, able to, to show that uh, more than 80% of the isoflavones were eliminated. So now about what, what can we do, uh, what can we say uh, from the modern making? So uh, we will talk first about the soy-based products uh, that are commercialized in France. Then we will talk about the industrial making and uh, the, their use in uh, food with hidden soy. So one of the most popular soy food in France is soy milk. And it is made uh, by uh, from uh, soy seeds that are soaked uh, for 24 hours and ground in, in the soaking water. Then there is water which is added and the suspension is cooked for 20 minutes before filtration. And the cooking water is used to make the milk and therefore it is not eliminated. This soy milk is used to make yogurt and to make desert creams. And of course, because the cooking water is kept uh, the isoflavones are also kept in these recipes. So when we measure isoflavones in uh, food stuff uh, in, in France, this is the results of 140 uh, measurements. You can see that some, uh, some uh, portions of uh, food are very concentrated in isoflavones with sometimes level up um, uh, up to uh, 44 and more than 40 milligrams of isoflavones per portion. And this is a mean. So the way we are preparing soy protein now is uh, very different than uh, the ancestral uh, 
uh, recipes. Here is uh, the Cargill uh, factory in Canada. And uh, the way they prepare soy is first dehulling uh, soy seed, then uh, grounding them uh, and defatting them with hexane. They obtain a deflated uh, cake, which is extruded to make uh, soy protein. And here is the extruder. Uh, during this process, the cooking time is reduced to a few seconds, and of course, because there is no water in the, in the process, isoflavones are still present, and they can be very highly concentrated in soy flakes. Here, it's up to 180 uh, milligram per 100 gram. These proteins are used to make uh, French um, modern recipes here that are far from being uh, traditional, of course, and uh, these contain a uh, quite high amount of uh, isoflavones here. So individually, these uh, doses are not of concern, at least for adults. But if you accumulate uh, several portions uh, a day, then you can lead, it can lead to high exposure. And it is even uh, uh, more true for, for children. So uh, we try to uh, assess the modern exposure through a uh, first, uh, uh, first evaluation of the soy food consumption nowadays in France. Then we will talk about uh, the isoflavone exposure. And uh, we will also have a, a look at uh, uh, food with hidden soy. So uh, we, we made an inquiry on uh, um, the website of different uh, supermarkets in, in France uh, to assess the distribution of the soy-based product and we found that that 64% of uh, the soy, which is eaten in France by the French population, comes uh, with foodstuff with hidden soy. And 36% uh, of uh, uh, the soy, which is eaten by the French population, uh, is uh, from specific soy-based food. Uh, from another inquiry that we, we led in uh, 2017 on premenopausal women, we showed uh, at that time that nearly 50% of the inquired women had soy at least occasionally in the last um, year. And that uh, uh, this practice was quite recent because um, half of them uh, claimed to have that uh, at, in the last three year, years. So um, we now try to find where, what could be the, the main contributors to the isoflavone exposure in the French population. And you can see that uh, food with hidden soy represents nearly 30% of the exposure. And then from uh, dessert, cream, and yogurts, and then elaborated dishes, including uh, soy, um, soy uh, cakes. Here uh, you have some figures, uh, uh, the exposure of soy non-consumers that are exposed through uh, hidden soy. And in fact, um, their exposure has been shown to be about two milligrams per day. And uh, for soy consumer, it can reach uh, seven milligrams per day. Again, uh, these figures are not of concern, but they reflect a high variability in the population. And in our inquiry in 2017, we found that that nearly 12% of the women inquired had more than nine portions of soy per week. And of course, these women uh, were exposed to high level of isoflavones over 50 milligrams per day. And these uh, levels are known to disrupt uh, the menstrual cycle. So what could be now the potential health effect? In fact, there are beneficial effects of isoflavones, uh, but there are also toxic, toxic effects that have been reported with, by the National Toxicology Program in the US on reproduction and on cancer. And then we can derive a reference dose. So uh, about the beneficial effects, there are still uh, some which are disputed, but uh, it is likely that isoflavone can relieve uh, menopausal symptoms in menopausal women. It is likely that they can prevent breast cancer in healthy women. Uh, it is likely that they can preserve bone, um, uh, but um, the prevention of osteoporosis has not been uh, 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 proven yet. And it is also possible that they can prevent prostate cancer. Um, 
Uh, however, the diabetes prevention, the hypercholesterolemia hyper prevention and immunity preservation has not yet been uh, evidence at least for uh, isoflavones, although soy may have uh, some effects. What you can see here is that all the likely or possible effects can be recorded after uh, 50 years of age, of age. And in parallel, the National Toxicology Program uh, made some uh, multi-generational reproductive toxicology study with genistein, the main uh, phytoestrogen, and showed that um, uh, with uh, relevant doses uh, to, to the human exposure and on sixth generation, uh, there were some uh, uh, impairment of uh, uh, weight in, in, in females and also a reduction in the analgesic criteria. There were also a reduction of weight in males and reduced analgesic distance in the first generation and also other specific effects in males. And the fertility of the animals uh, was, um, was disturbed uh, in the F2 generation. And therefore, the National Toxicology Program um, um, declared that uh, the, there were some reprotoxic effects uh, that were probably linked to the estrogenic effect of genistein. Sorry, I have to admit some people. Thank you. Uh, then the National Toxicology Program uh, made uh, also a toxicology uh, study on the carcinogenesis uh, of genistein. There all, it was also a multi-generational study using uh, dietary doses. And uh, that, that um, study, they also found uh, some reproductive impairment, but also the appearance of adenomas and carcinomas for the mammary gland and the pituitary in the F1 generation, and also equivocal cases in F2 and F3 generations. So the NTP uh, said that uh, genistein uh, has a um, carcinogenic effect and probably due to its estrogenic effects. So from these data, we can derive a reference dose, which is a safety limit. And this reference dose can be calculated from a uh, low AEL and applied uh, different safety factors. One here uh, is um, the inter reflects inter-individual variation in human. This one uh, reflects the difference between uh, animals and humans. And this one uh, is the um, uncertainty between a low AEL and no AEL. And uh, here we found, we, we, uh, we decided to calculate two reference doses. In one case, uh, the, the uncertainty between low AEL is, to no AEL is one, which is normally not uh, applicable. And in the other case, it is three. And therefore, we can uh, uh, calculate uh, a maximum reference dose and a minimum reference dose. Uh, the maximum reference dose is 0.35 milligram per kilo body weight per day, and the minimum is 0.12 milligram per kilo body weight per day. And this means that for an adult weighing uh, 60 kilos, the maximum dose is 21 milligram per day, and the minimum dose is 7 milligram per day. And for a child, it's 10. 0.5 milligram per day and 3.5 milligram per day. The dose we measured in our uh, foodstuff, you can see that there is a concern, at least for the minimum dose in uh, adults, uh, because most of the foodstuff are over this uh, limit. And it is even worse for children, since even the foodstuff with hidden soy can contain uh, more uh, isoflavones than required. So fortunately, we have an industrial solution because we are working actually with in the, uh, the industry. And some industrial uh, decided to include, you can see that it works very well because uh, we managed to eliminate more than 90% uh, of the isoflavones and we could reach uh, the safety limits for adults and children. So the take-home messages from this uh, exposure uh, ex uh, talk, sorry, is that uh, plant products can be both beneficial or deleterious. 
and isoflavones from soy bear, the two faces of the corn. And the traditional cooking practices remove them from the Asian food, and the modern industrial making keep, making keep them in foodstuff. So in France, due to recent diet evolution, uh, the isoflavone exposure is raising dramatically, and this substance can be beneficial over uh, 50 years of age, but nowadays they appear to be uh, more deleterious and beneficial for the global population. Fortunately, they can be removed from foodstuff by simple water treatments. So thank you for your attention and uh, I'm ready for your question if you have. Uh, Catherine, I have a, yes. a half question, half comment. Um, you're talking about uh, recent diet evolution. I think it's even more true because of the tens, the the, the, the trend now for uh, you know vegetarian food, even vegan food, protein from plants, and so on. So I think you're uh, you have been advocating for this. Uh, uh safety concern for for years but now it becomes even more um, um important i guess yes of course and uh, this is why i am still uh, communicating on this uh, aspect because uh, uh maybe our indian partners don't know but uh, uh, now in school uh, there are some uh, vegetarian uh, dishes that are proposed and uh, because it is very easy to do that, uh, the cookers propose uh, soybean-based uh, food to our children. And actually, uh, at least these uh, products are industrial and they contain very high level of isoflavones that can be adverse later in life. Yes, Mr. Donger. Yeah. <laughs> Christine, very interesting yes. presentation and uh, very good topic. In fact, I was in University of Bordeaux in 1983 as a postdoc. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> uh, I wanted to ask you because you see, we this is the area where I expect that uh, Fr French people and the Indian people should collaborate because uh, we are, uh, I mean, uh, growing soya bean in a huge quantity, particularly in Maharashtra and some other part of Karnataka and Madhya Pradesh. Huge quantity of soybean is grown by our farmers and we are just doing extraction of oil and the remaining de oil cake is being exported or it is being used as animal feed. So uh, it's, I was very happy to see that you have uh, I mean, explained nicely uh, the uh, soya protein isolation. So, I mean, I will write to you because we are interested to get a very good technology from France for soya oh, proteins it would be a pleasure really so, a food grade food grade soya protein uh, you see some people now they have started that vegetable uh, vegetable based uh, non vegetarian food something like that and they are importing uh, i mean uh, these proteins are other things from europe <laughs> it would be a pleasure to work with you of course yeah thank yeah, you yeah i, I can uh, connect you to some of the industries uh, here uh, for example, Kargil, you work, I mean, has a factory in Pune, but they only extract oil and they export the de-oil de cake uh, to Europe and other places. And there are other players who are interested in going for value addition of uh, soya bean. So thank you very much. Yeah, uh, I, will write to, I will write to you. I will write okay. to you. Yes, thank you. Dr. Catherine, uh, can I say something? Yes, please. I think it's a similar problem in the Indian market also. Um, like our traditional cookings, you may be familiar with uh, dosa and idli. Now we are getting um, instant mix, where uh, you know otherwise, uh, like some of us still follow traditional. We overnight soak the seeds, and the next day wash them and do make the batter. But now we are getting instant mixes where without soaking, their uh, powder have been sold. I think the young generation will be facing not only soya, many um, bean varieties like uh, black gram and other, uh, not only isoflavones, there are many anti-nutrients, uh, right? 
so all those will be washed out majority of them in proper uh, soaking and uh, while germinating they lose them so a, a similar problem is coming to india also indian traditional food also so very yes. interesting you are well, if i can help and it, 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 attention is required at global level yes thank you <laughs> I can help. Of course, it would be uh, always pleasure for for thirty years probably. So uh, I would be very happy if I can prevent uh, some yeah. overuse of uh, phytoestrogens. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So um, please, uh, all can all the speakers can uh, uh, them uh, their sorry. Can all the speakers switch on their camera for a, a group picture, please? And if Olivier is with us, it would be fine to have him. I just told him to join. Okay. Sarada. So, uh, well, because we are waiting for, for Olivier, do you have any other question or uh, any remark or um, anything to, to say? Here he is, okay. Hello, Olivier. Fine. So I don't know how to... I will take the screen capture if some more everyone can switch on their camera for the group photo. It's requesting everyone You're to... Welcome. You're... Hello, Olivier. You're welcome if you want to switch on your camera. It would be fine because we are plenty of us. <laughs> Mr. Dong. No, you have been very active on this session. So if you want to switch on your camera, it would be a pleasure. Oh, thank you. You have you with thank us. You. <laughs> I have switched on my camera. Am I visible? Not, not very well, but. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I will switch out the lights. <laughs> I think it's better everybody can uh, turn their camera on, right? Yes, it will be oh, cool. Yes, yes, it will be fine. Is it okay? Yes, it's I'm, better. Thank I'm you. at home. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Reddy. Hello, Mr. Ganizan. So are we ready? Uh, on the count Dr. of... Uh, Maybe you, you can switch on. You can come with us, maybe. Okay, yeah, so working in the lab here. Good. Dr. Shubangi, are you with us? It would be fine to have you on your picture, on our picture, please. Let me know when you're ready. Hello, Shubangi. Shubangi is just coming. Okay. Hello, Shubangi. <laughs> Good to see you. <laughs> Okay, everyone, uh, smile, please, on the count of uh, three, two, one, smile. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you to you. <laughs> okay, so if we...
you want, we can uh, start our uh, roundtable. And uh, first, I, I would like to welcome uh, Varsha. Maybe you can uh, tell us more about uh, uh, your topic and uh, the microbiome uh, of skin. And of course, all of you are welcome to ask questions. So Varsha, if you want to start. It seems we've lost uh, Varsha. Oh, no, yes. Okay. So, Far Varsha, uh, are you with us? Maybe we can switch off our camera for a while because it seems that there are some problems with uh, um, Varsha, we will try to have Varsha uh, for her talk. Varsha, can you can you hear us? Can you hello? Your your microphone in is off. Can you hear? Yeah, okay. okay. Yes, okay. yes, yes, fine. Perfect. Thank you. I think there was some problem with the net connection. I'm sorry. Catherine, I'm not able to hear you. Catherine, you're on mute. Yes, uh, if you want to, to give us more details about your topic and what we, we could do with you uh, in the future, uh, what you are interested in, in uh, it would be fine. Thank you. Okay. Okay. I will Thank take you. notes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. So um, carrying on from where I left, uh, we are potentially working on two organisms. I will be um, able to name those organisms now. And one is Propionibacterium acne. And uh, Propionibacterium acne is uh, always looked down upon because it is the organism which is an opportunistic pathogen and it is known to cause a lot of uh, skin infections and acne. But in the recent years, the uh, role of uh, Clostridium acne or, or your Propionibacterium acne has emerged in a new light. And what scientists have found, and we have also confirmed, is that it is capable of producing an antimicrobial peptide. And this antimicrobial peptide obviously uh, is produced because of its metabolism. It is found in huge numbers on your skin already, okay? Uh, acne, two organisms, one is Staphylococcus epidermidis and second is Propionibacterium acne. You already have them on your skin. We are trying to unfold the role that they play in maintaining your skin health. Now, if you understand that the young skin and the aged skin have differences in the colonies or the number of these organisms that exist. So the ratio of Propionibacterium acne and uh, Staphylococcus epidermidis will vary. But both of them have a very critical role to play in maintenance of the skin health um, in producing antioxidant products and producing antimicrobial peptides which enable or which stop the pathogenic organisms from inhibiting your, um, uh, colonizing your skin. So we are looking at certain plant products and we are already in uh, work with someone wherein these products can help us establish the, uh, or maintain the flora of the skin of an individual so that it is not prone to acne, it is cured of acne. So in short, if we are dealing with a young skin, for us, for a person who is young, we need to control the population of propionate bacterium acne as compared to an elderly skin, wherein we need to promote the growth of propionate bacterium acne because propionate bacterium acne will secrete, will help in the sebum secretion. So 
all of these plant extracts, whether uh, Dr. Vishnu Prasad spoke or whether Alexander spoke about these plant extracts, if we have any of these plant extracts and if we can test them in the way that they can modulate the skin flora, obviously it will be of uh, great interest to us. And uh, also identifying the products that these organisms make. So antimicrobial peptides and antioxidants are uh, a few products which have been established but any other products which they make and which will play a critical role in maintaining the skin health is what we are looking at. Looking out at. Um, so basically we are looking for prebiotic and uh, probiotic for skin. Okay. So also any micro encapsulation techniques for um, uh, say release of these probiotics or uh, prebiotics on the skin is also what we are looking for. And uh, the more number of samples and the diverse uh, samples that we get. So we have sampled over say 200 people and tested their um, uh, normal flora uh, for the skin. They are from diverse socioeconomic background. They have um, diverse dietary patterns. Uh, in India, of course, there is a lot of diversity. So we have managed to get a good population. But uh, of course, if we increase that number, we will be able to get an idea as to exactly how these organisms behave in different people and how can we modulate these organisms. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, I took notes. I will submit them to you because uh, as you saw, I, I, I had to, to to see somebody uh, during your talk, so maybe I, I missed something. But uh, um, I, I will uh, I will come back to you to, to check if I, I go to the notes properly. So um, now um, I think uh, this is Vishnu. <laughs> uh, Vishnu, can you can you tell us uh, what you would expect from uh, our collaborations and what you are looking for in the future, either with France or, in, or with uh, other people in India, of course. Yeah, uh, the, thank you, uh, Professor uh, Catherine. Uh, so uh, in continuation to my uh, presentation, so we are um, uh, looking at this uh, transdisciplinary approach using Ayurveda and Ayurveda formulations as a tool to uh, understand the uh, uh, biological pathways and all those things. So. In this uh, kind of a you know a collaboration with a different uh, team, uh, definitely uh, I did not say that when we say transdisciplinary, it is actually collaboration with all sort of experts. One of the major uh, uh, point that we are uh, looking for could be something like you know understanding the uh, chemical moieties and its uh, you know metabolomics and its interaction with the major uh, uh, pathways and their crosstalks and this kind of uh, what I can say, a global analysis of all these things with respect to a particular uh, tissue system or with respect to a particular, uh, you know, uh, cell model, or sometimes it can be even at the uh, systemic level, like, you know, how a particular, you know, uh, animal uh, model we can think of, or even sometimes uh, small organs or models can be uh, considered for that. So that the idea is to <laughs> delineate the uh, complex biology uh, through which all these formulations are working, that is one. And the second thing is that the complexity or the uh, network pharmacology kind of an aspect that we need to study because, as I mentioned that one side we have a multi, uh, uh, you know, components that is present in this formulation that is interacting with multiple targets. And the second is that these targets are most of the time will be interacting with different other diseases as well. So that was something that I mentioned in my slide that is called as disease-some, where the omics of the disease also we can consider, which will give us an idea what are the uh, key uh, targets that we can uh, uh, look for so that the uh, uh, overall metabolic activities or overall uh, health and wellness can be targeted. Uh, currently, most of the time we are uh, looking at very specific targets. So from that kind of an approach, we need to go for a better, uh, you know, uh, broader approach so that you can really consider how some of these formulations can be 
explored for their uh, promotive, preventive, as well as curative approach. So this is a kind of uh, uh, dream that we carry in our uh, mind when we work on Ayurveda formulations. And to add to what that uh, uh, question that Professor Catherine was asking about the clinical uh, efficacy. So one of the advantages that we have from our side is uh, uh, first one that these formulations, what we are selecting, all of them are uh, proven in their uh, clinical, or rather instead of proven, I would say it is time tested for uh, you know several decades. People are using that in the clinical practice. And the second thing is uh, we have facilities for clinical uh, studies, so we can actually uh, think of uh, you know taking that uh, uh, knowledge from the clinical uh, uh, experiences to the lab as well as something if it is there in the lab we can definitely think of taking that into the uh, clinical uh, uh, field also. So this is the kind of uh, collaboration that we can really think of. So this is what I would like to say at this stage for to you know set the context and to begin the discussion. And maybe once we get into the uh, further discussions, uh, I can uh, you know, contribute more. And also I would like to uh, take some questions if somebody has. Thank you, Professor Catherine. Thank you very much, Vishnu. Uh, you, uh, Alexandra, I know that you have a lot of things to, to propose. So please uh, um, take, take uh, the microphone and, uh, and you can uh, tell us. Yeah, thank you, Catherine. Uh, I noted actually only four uh, items uh, to speak. Uh, first, of course, I think uh, students and researchers, big centers between France and India, are, are, uh, are um, important to give time to ideas and project to, to build. You know, of course, we can, uh, ideas can arise from, from talks like that, but I think it's necessary to, to have some time, you know, go deeper in the project and see how each of us, we, we approach a, a, an issue, a, a field, a disease, a topic, and then ideas can come uh, up uh, from that. So. Of course, I know uh, uh, Embassy and Institut Français en Inde uh, are devoted to that, but I would want to, to stress it, this, that's important. Second point, suggestion, would be to, um, in the field of uh, safety evaluation of foods, drugs, dietary supplements, medicinal plants and everything, uh, keep building bridges and experience sharing between India and France or even EU level. I know a few things exist, like uh, I think there is a committee working on Ayurvedic Indian medicinal plants, which are candidates applying to um, inclusion into um, European pharmacopoeia. I don't know how really that works, if it's uh, fruitful, if it, if it has enough um, support and so on, but this kind of thing, and also food safety, uh, it's, uh, it's always time to improve uh, food safety and diet supplement in any part of the world. You know, it's uh, ever uh, uh, growing um, work needed here. Third point, uh, you all, you may all know that there is a huge uh, fuzz now around the world, uh, especially in the West uh, side of the world, on, on cannabis and uh, use that medicinal for its medicinal purpose, uh, cannabidiol for in food and so on, and so on. So, I must confess, I don't know how much um, this wave, this trend, has been followed in India but there are probably uh, dozens of topics uh, in which India could, could contribute uh, in terms of, for example, um, uh, geno, genotype database uh, and improving varieties from, from Europe and so on. So uh, France is an is a important um, producer of hemp. And uh, I think there, there are probably ways here to, to collaborate on a very applied area. And then the last point I, I thought about, I, I thought about was uh, proposing to, to set up kind of a, um, a reviewing committee for projects. I'm not talking here about funding. It would be a, 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 yeah, a steering committee in French, for example, who would receive 
um, project ideas and that would uh, commend them, you know, okay, this idea, checking this activity on this plant, it's a good idea, but maybe you, you could uh, enlarge it to uh, another plant or another area, another activity and so on, given in the frame of your uh, facilities, of your funding and everything. So no funding, no, 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 um, no, no cutting, uh, not preventing anyone to do what he wants, but uh, helping uh, to 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 even pull higher the the you know the uh, the scientific um, standards and and uh, I missed the word you know um, uh, everyone of us all of us we expect high Where result you add, from. You mean to say? Where you are? Um, uh, no, but all of us we of course expect high result from all the effort we put. And sometimes um, uh, external input uh, um, uh, above uh, before the start, you know, can be very useful. So I would, I, I again, I don't know if such um, uh, uh, helping committee exists, but maybe it could be a good idea. It could, you know, help researchers to 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 um, uh, refine their project. It could help students to help project then if this let's call it committee could uh, label the projects and say okay we 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 we've looked at it we made this uh, this document uh, making this suggestion this this could be used for you know uh, granting applications and so on and uh, of and also it it could be um, a good way to connect people who work on the same thing um, provided they agree for that. And okay, uh, let's say that this committee receive uh, 10 applications on, uh, on curcuma or on whatever plant, okay. If you agree, we can exchange your contact with someone else and then maybe you can put your efforts to, together, not doing all at the same time, the same thing, but um, um, you know, um, sharing, okay, you, you take this uh, biological part and we all start from the same uh, sample and then we can compare the results, etc. I know that uh, this type of collaboration is not always uh, you know, possible, it's not always welcome, but if people uh, above, um, ahead of uh, the uh, applying, so to speak, would say, okay, I'm okay to share my contact with anybody working on that, uh, it could, it may help to, to make projects, you, you know, uh, more efficient or more uh, fruitful. So these were my four, my, my four um, suggestions. Uh, Cyril, do you have any uh, requirements? Uh, what would you expect from uh, uh, an Indian-French collaboration? Thank you, Catherine. So um, I have seen a lot of uh, interesting things during this presentation. And uh, we can share, uh, as I say, Alexandre, um, exchange with uh, students and, uh, and uh, researchers. It could be very interesting. Uh, for our school, uh, what it could be interesting is to have perhaps some uh, PhD student in common with uh, Indian University because here we have not uh, the habilitation for uh, for the research uh, in intern at school. And I think perhaps in the Indian University, you have uh, some person we, we could do that. Uh, we have a network in France. It could be interesting for the consortium because we have a, a daily link with industries in France and for cosmetic and perfumery. It could be interesting to share these networks with uh, Indian uh, partners. Uh, we could provide some skills uh, such as uh, sensory analysis if we want to focus on um, perfumery uh, field, for example, uh, or uh, in supercritical fluid to, to try other, um, other type of extraction. Uh, as you see on the, on the slide, our equipment uh, could be accessible to, to everyone if you want. If someone wants to come here, student or researcher, to try this uh, type of equipment uh, on plant. 
And for the, the cosmetic parts, we have to be aware to regulation uh, because uh, when I work with Clarence, we have the Nagoya aspect uh, to uh, to use some plants. And I don't know exactly in India uh, uh, what we have uh, uh, in terms of Nagoya protection. Uh, on the second, uh, very uh, important for um, cosmetic industries is a positive China list uh, because we have to to have Inkinem uh, present on this list to um, to sell product in China. So we can compare if you have some plant, uh, endemic plant in India, uh, you think uh, could be interesting uh, for cosmetics. We can try to, to do together some extra and try uh, to define the biologic uh, properties of this uh, of this extract. We don't do this at uh, at school for the biological aspect. We have some partners, so uh, Indian partners could be a, a good uh, a good opportunity for us. Thank you very much. Uh, it's very interesting. Uh, so I think we are going uh, out of the time, but I just want to tell you that. Uh, we, we will try to come to India next uh, March. Uh, I may have some money at least for Alexandra and, uh, and myself. Uh, and um, we will uh, try to go on with our project of uh, International Master. Um, and uh, of course, it will be a pleasure to meet you and to discuss uh, about uh, education, but also about, uh, about science. And um, um, what, uh, yes, uh, we may have uh, also some uh, people from the industry with us that are really, really uh, interesting in collaborating with uh, Indian scientists to guarantee the quality of uh, plant products that could reach the food supplement market uh, in the EU, but also in France, of course. Uh, they are desperating, uh, desperately uh, searching for good quality products. And of course, uh, this quality is so yourself, of course. So um, uh, I'm ready to collaborate on my uh, little topic, of course, uh, which may have some consequences uh, at the population level. <laughs> uh, and But this is my expertise at the moment. Uh, and we also develop uh, cell culture. Uh, actually, we are working on uh, breast cancer cells, uh, with, uh, which are triple negative uh, breast cancer cells. And also, on, we are also uh, developing some clinical approaches uh, with our medical colleagues here in Belgium. Uh, so uh, I don't know, uh, do you have any other things to add? Uh, maybe uh, Olivia has probably vanished, I don't know. He may have, may not be here. But Amruta or Menakshi, Inakshi, do you have something to add before we are closing uh, the meeting? No, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you all the participants to participate in this workshop. Olivier, do you have something to say to us? To say us? Uh, right. Thank you very much, Catherine. Uh, not right now, because as you know, I had to switch between seven parallel workshops. So it was quite difficult to, to follow, to, to concentrate. Maybe, maybe just uh, first of all, uh, acknowledge all of you, because uh, mostly Shubangi and Catherine as, as chair, but I, I, I find, you know, this kind of event, it's not a scientific conference. It's not a publication. It's not a communication. It's not so, so easy. I was, indeed, I was uh, nicely surprised by the adhesion, enthusiasm, and response of you all uh, uh, in all the fields of the, the scientists that who kindly accepted to, to come and share. And so our responsibility now will be to, to take our recommendation and, and comments and remarks and, and issues that, that you raised and try to, to, to work on, on different aspects of the kind of response we can have for that. But for that, we need some time of, you know, synthesis, uh, like synthesizing, analyzing, maybe short meeting together with the chair of the different workshop. We will. Uh, 
uh, edit a booklet. Uh, 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 till now, it was only only all virtual, but we, we will edit a booklet with the full program, the text, the the, the, the concept, the, the concept of the of the different topics, and hopefully the the synthesis of uh, of recommendation and proposal for for the track to to upcoming action and, and program we, we could imagine together. Uh, it was amazing. I was uh, writing that to Subangi that some of kind, I, I, I already had very, you know, just some bullet points of conclusions of the, of the yesterday session. It's quite interesting that some topics, transverse topic, we, we can see them in marine sciences were discussed in open science and, and, and in, in catalysis in chemistry. It's quite interesting. So, so I guess that we will, which, which not always is evident, but we will this time have real, uh, I, would, I don't know if we can say outreach or put for or, or this workshop. So uh, thank you all for you all, all really for, for, for this uh, adhesion and participation that showed that there is a real interest of this scientific collaboration between France and India. Thank you very much. I just want to add one thing. Uh, of course, uh, our uh, email address will be given. So if you need to contact us for anything, if you've been interested by what we've, uh, we've presented to you, please uh, do. Uh, it will be a pleasure to, to give more uh, impact to this uh, manifestation by, by creating new collaborations, of course. Yes, Olivier. <laughs> no, and, and, and who kindly agrees it will be very nice for us, but through Catherine and Shubangi to collect the, the, the slides that you presented the, 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 during the, the workshop. It will be very nice to, 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 to collect. And if you authorize also to put uh, online uh, for, for, for the, the attendees of the Knowledge Summit with your authorization. Okay. okay. <laughs> I think we've gone uh, out of our uh, time slot. Uh, I hope everybody is happy. And uh, well, I, I thank you very much because uh, you've been very, very uh, interesting. And uh, all our uh, auditors have been uh, very uh, uh, interested also. I, I have some uh, messages coming down and uh, it seems that uh, we, we made the job, <laughs> at least. <laughs> Thank you very much to all. And uh, well, I, I, I will shut now the, uh, the meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, 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 Thank you, Professor. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye